I'm going live now. Let's do it. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign. It'd be great if you could support by donating or sharing with the networks. The link is HTTPS cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is John Neff. John, are you ready to be great today? Ready to be great today. John, so you have like so much going on right now. I mean, like you're doing a lot. Like what's, what do you focus on right now? I do have a lot going on. That's right. Um, my immediate focus right now is um, I founded a company called Compo Designs and we are getting ready for our first Kickstarter campaign launching on May 13th of 2021. So a Kickstarter, a Kickstarter is like, how my crowdfunding is like a software pl product. Kickstarter is more like for actual hardware products, right? Like actual, you know, putting your hand products, right? That's right. Yep. And so we're launching a, uh, a tent that uh, I helped design and develop over the last couple of years. It's called the uh, Escape M4, and it's a patented tent, uh, the only one in the world that opens and closes. So it's got a retractable canopy. So there's, I mean, I have to guess there's like millions of tents out there, right? Right. I mean, besides this, you know, um, I, like I said it before, it's like on a pre-talk, it's like a, a convertible tent. What's the really big difference between your convertible tent and other tents out there? I think that's the main thing, is that the fact that it is convertible. So if, it's, uh, if you're at the beach, you can open up the canopy fully so that you can get some sun. Uh, if you're camping and planning on sleeping in it and you want a little bit of uh, protection, you can, you can close the top down, zip it closed. Um, it's, it's got a lot of the same features as, as many tents on the market. It's waterproof. It's got a rain fly. Um, but ours is, is basically shaped like a hemisphere. And again, the patented part is the fact that, uh, that it opens and closes. So, so how, how do you make this tent? Like, is, is like, um, is it like handmade, like machines are making it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's manufactured much like uh, any other tent on the market. Um, but because of the shape and the, the design of it, uh, it's, it's definitely more technical and more expensive. Um, we can't just run a, you know, a big piece of material through a, a machine and, and have every cut be the same. Um, again, because of the size that tapers at certain points, it gets wider at other points, things like that. So, yeah. And is there different colors for the tent? Was it one color for everyone? The, well, the, the tent itself, um, we're nailing down the final color right now. We've been putting out surveys to our uh, social media following and uh, getting- Like votes. user research, so to speak. Exactly. And getting votes on people's favorite colors. Um, the style that we currently have as a main body that's green, the door is yellow with black accents, and then the rain fly is yellow as well. And you're going to make this here in the United States, in Mexico, China, or how's that going to work? Yeah, unfortunately not in the United States. Um, we'll be making it in China. Um, that's where most tents are made, either China or Vietnam. And you have like extensive, extensive experience in China. Like you, you've been there like probably 10 million thousand times or some crazy number, right? <laughs> Yeah. What's been the pros and cons of like doing business in China? Yeah, I mean, I've been to China over 50 times uh, over the course of really 20 years, roughly. Um, the pros, it's a long ways away, uh, or con rather. Um, you know, it's, Some people say that's a pro, right? It's a long way away. <laughs> Get away from their family, their friends, you know? <laughs> Potentially, for sure. Um, let's start with the pros. Um, it's easy to do business in China. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I started 20 years ago. Things have changed dramatically you have to deal with the language barrier or do you know chinese no i can say a couple of words i could that's not really a problem then no not really a problem um you know and and much like anywhere else in the world um english is just such a hugely spoken language that the, all the young people in china learn it in university and so uh it makes it really easy for us to go over there and do business um so that's a pro for sure um it's easy to do business in china um, I love the culture, you know, having gone there so many times, I've been to weddings in China. Uh, I've been to, uh, friends, parents house in China. Um, you know, I've been to most of the major cities. Uh, I love the food. That's a, that's a definite, yeah, definite plus. That's a plus for me. Uh, cons, uh, they, you know, sometimes the food bites back in China. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fact. It's a reality. Um, and you mean literally it bites back. It bites back literally. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, oftentimes you have to drive a lot in cars and it's, it, that's a little stressful, um, you know, being so far away from home and, and people certainly drive differently in China than they do, uh, here in the States. Um, but yeah, all in all, it's a great experience for me. You know, there's, there's such a long history for me there that, um, yeah, I, I, I like doing business here. 
And, and like, how does someone find a factory to use? Is there like, is there like an agent you go to in China and they find you an agent? How does that even work? Sure. There's the, uh, there's definitely the agent route. Um, and that kind of alleviates the need to go to China for a lot of people. Um, I know people that have companies that manufacture in China, they've never been. Um, I'm more of a face-to-face kind of person. So I really enjoy that, that kind of connection. Um, there are kind of the the typical ways. Global sources is one. Uh, it's a website. Um, of course, uh, Alibaba is another. Um, I think kind of a basic entry road into China for for manufacturing is um, the Canton Fair. That's always a a great place for people to start. Um, one of the biggest trade shows in the world, and so you can shop everything from uh, garden fertilizer to automotive parts to uh, makeup and fashion and and kind of my niche, uh, sporting goods in the outdoors. So in, in China, like when you go there, how, how what's the longest you've been in China for one time? Uh, about two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. So not really that, not very long, right? Not very long. Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, when I first started going there, I would, I would really just go for 10 to 12 days. Um, I've got it down to four or five now. Um, you know, I used to do a lot of travel to the factories. Uh, but the more business I've done, I've I've really been able to kind of get the factories to come to me um, and then, of course, meet in their offices in the main cities um, so that you're not going to kind of rural China, which requires a lot of car travel. And again, that's that's not my favorite, favorite way to travel over there. And can you kind of give us an idea how big China is? I don't think people realize. I think people realize it's big. They don't realize how big China actually is, right? It's pretty big. Um, yeah, it's huge. Um, obviously, stretches all the way up to Russia. Um, you know, all the way to Eastern Europe. I mean, in terms of the population, it's massive. I think it's 5X uh, the United States at this point. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think to to, um, to fly from Hong Kong to Shanghai is, I don't quote me, but I think it's four and a half, five hours. And that's just on the Eastern seaboard. Mm-hmm. Um, fortunately, though, China's developed an incredible railway system. And so you can, you know, you can be on a train going 400 kilometers an hour and, and you know, relaxing and taking it easy while you're traveling so and you haven't been this since covid kicked off right i have not no. um my last visit to asia was singapore uh the end of 2019 just before covid okay and yeah you, um, you have a lot of friends over there that you keep in touch with or is this mainly just business people yeah i mean it's biz- it's friendship mm-hmm. business turned friendship rather um so i do stay in touch with them and and i'm still of course working in and with china i've got um, some clients that i work with and do business for in america um, in one of my other businesses. Um, but yeah, definitely stay in touch. And then you, you, you do it. A, you're like a war traveler. You did a trip to Thailand a while ago. You did some kind of hike in Thailand, I think, or something you were doing there. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I did. So in, in my first company, I was doing some international sales toward the end, just really developing our, our international network. Uh, and so my big customer in Thailand, uh, I became good friends with. And so he invited me over for what they called a Fjall Raven, which is a Swedish backpack brand. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the Fjall Raven Thailand Classic. And so it was a 60 kilometer trek uh, up near Myanmar, Myanmar rather, um, in Northwest Thailand. And so, yeah, it was like a four night trek. And, you know, we were going into 2000 year old villages where, you know, many people, many Westerners have never set foot in. And so really an amazing experience. Yeah. So uh, when I was stationed in Korea with a family, my wife has a cousin that lives in Thailand. So his story was like he was in the Air Force in the 70s, got out in Thailand, stayed there, became pretty much like full-time Chinese, a Thailand person right now. But he lived in a town called Prachtenburi, like three hours east of Bangkok. So like like the, like the real Thailand. We don't forget the first night we go there, right? He picks on the Air Force, we go there. And we see people running around town, like what's going on? Oh, like um, there's a tiger that lives here that walks through the village like once a month. And, and, and today's the day to walk through the village. He came a day early, so we weren't prepared, you know? Like what? <laughs> like one, once a month, this tiger would walk through the village, you know? But this time it came a day early, so we're ready, right? He's like the chief. Yeah. Thanks. So that was craziness. Um, so you, you, you've been to a lot of countries. What's been your favorite place to travel so far? Uh, I mean, I, I love Thailand. Um, China, oddly, is one of my top five, I think. Um, I met my, my wife in Peru um, on the Inca Trail. So I think, you know, that's got a special place in my mm-hmm. heart. Uh, and, and Mexico as well. Mm-hmm. So what's the place you've been, you travel to that's like kind of random that you actually like, but people were like, you like that place? Like, I will never go there, but you actually liked it. I think China's probably one of them. Yeah. Um, where else? Um, I don't know. I think, you know, for the most part, the the countries I've been to are, are pretty cool, mm-hmm. all of them. Um, 
I've been to uh, Morocco, you know, and and I think that surprises a lot of people. It's just not really on the, the beaten yeah. path, but I've been there a couple of times. I like that. Um, yeah, I can't really think of any that that would uh, okay come off as a negative. So as an entrepreneur, it's like you you've been uh, going towards like the outdoor space. Any right. particular reason why that you always been to outdoor space stuff, or always camping, or how did that happen that you kind of like you know entrepreneur in that space? Sure, sure. Um, I used to be in the hammock business, um, and that was just sort of random. And I I just landed there at one day. I just woke up in a hammock and started a, a hammock company. Um, and you know, after being in the in with that company for almost twenty years, um, it, it just became a very comfortable place for me. Um, you know, really in two thousand and eight, when the economy went bad, the outdoor industry uh, saw growth. Um, and again, during COVID, it's been a really strong uh, sector to be in. And so, um, you know, I have a lot of knowledge there. I have a lot of good connections and kind of a good understanding of most outdoor products and brands. And um, yeah, it's, it's just been a, it's, it's a good industry. And I, you know, I, I like kind of the, the social stance that a lot of companies in the outdoor industry have taken. And, and so, yeah, so, yeah, it's home now. So let's go way back in the day. You get out of high school, you decide to go in the Marines. I did. Yep. What, what, why, why, why the Marines? Why military? Why, you know, go to that thought process? Sure. Well, I mean, um, so my dad was in the Navy and, and one of my brothers was as well. Um, and I think the Navy's great, but I didn't really like their uniforms. Um, <laughs> I was in a political science class in, in community college. And I honestly, I didn't even know what the instructor was talking about. And, you know, he asked me a question and I, I, I didn't know. I wasn't even paying attention. And so um, he asked me, what, what are you doing here? And I, I just thought to myself, you know, that's a great question. I, I don't know. What, what I, am I doing here? What am I doing here? I'm, I'm, you know, my mom saved all this money to send me to college. I wasn't really paying attention and, and, uh, excelling, um, just wasn't a great place for me. And so I got up, packed my bag, uh, went home, uh, went to the drove up to the Marine Corps recruiter. Um, and I basically signed up. And the main reason was, is the Marine Corps has the best uniform. I mean, that's no, yeah. No. I'm, I'm in the Army, like, but there's no doubt the Marine has the best uniform. If I'm going to do this, I want to wear dress blues, you know, and I, and I always love the motto, the few, the proud. And so, um, yeah, one of the best decisions I've ever made. And then you were infantry, but you were like a special type of infantry, right? I was, yeah. So I was in the, uh, what's called the Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. And so uh, they have the LAV, the Light Armored Vehicles. And so that's just a, uh, they, they called us glorified grunts. And so, you know, um, but we, we got to laugh at them because we were driving and they were walking with their gear. So that was always, that was pretty cool. And you did like four or five years. I did four years, four years. So what are some things that, that you, you learned from the Marines that are helping you be, be an entrepreneur? Sure. Um, discipline, um, dedication. Um, you know, I think in the military as a whole, they sort of, it's very demanding, as you know, um, you don't get to decide your hours. Uh, you don't get to decide when it's time to eat. Um, you know, you're, you're really pushed all the time. Um, and I think, you know, that just instilled in me kind of a, a go get him attitude. I think I already had that, but mm -hmm. it just sort of amplified that. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, not being afraid of, of a challenge for sure. Um, and, you know, like mission accomplishment is, is one of the things they talk about constantly in the Marine Corps. And, and so really I've just sort of used that as my compass, I think, uh, it's been a long time since I was in the Marine Corps, but I, I still fall back on those lessons. And yeah, one and thing I think that. the military does a good job too is like you know, kick you down ten times, get up eleven times, you know, teach you resiliency, you know, you know, stick to this and stuff. I think that's a really important lesson. They, I agree. They teach you too. Yeah, absolutely. So you got you get out of the Marines, and what happens next? Yeah, so um, get out of the Marine Corps, and I went to work at the BNSF Railway. Uh, I was a conductor uh, in the freight train world. Um, did that for a couple of years. Um, but you know, it was, it was much like the military, very demanding, you know, you'd have to go to work at three in the morning. And, um, you know, I kind of started seeing like the way the guys lived. Um, and it really was never, I, I knew it wasn't going to be the kind of the end all be all for me. Um, and people always told me, man, you should be in sales. Like you'd be really good in sales. Yeah. And so I, I worked there about a couple of two years. Um, I did a loan out program to Temple, Texas. Um, I lived in the Bay Area, the railroad. And then I just resigned. Um, and, you know, 
friends, mom, friends that I was really close with, their parents called me and they're like, are you sure you want to do this? You're giving up this amazing pension and this, all this great stuff. And so that's when you started figuring out that you want to be an entrepreneur, right? Like, like you didn't want to for anyone else. You don't want to like a regular nine to five life. Yeah, it, it was coming. It, it, was, yeah. it was coming at that point. And then I, I went into sales. Um, I did really well. And then the company I was working for went into uh, chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, and so luckily my boss at the time was a former Marine Corps pilot. And I decided a friend of mine and I decided we were going to go to Thailand and for the first time. And, uh, so I called up my boss and, uh, he basically he said, all right, you know, do your thing, check your email once a week, if you can. And, uh, you know, I won't charge you any vacation time. And I was like, this is amazing. Uh, nice Marine Corps connection there for me. And so went to Thailand, uh, where later then I met my first business partner and, uh, started the, the hammock company that I mentioned. Um, and, you know, really once I started doing that, you know, I, I knew that I had found my niche mm -hmm. in life, um, and, you know, it's funny too, like, I, I don't, I hope that I never land in a position where I'll, <laughs> I'm forced to think about working for somebody and getting a job, a real job, that is. Um, I love being an entrepreneur. I, the freedom is, is amazing. Um, you know, I work very hard, long hours. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, it's kind of, um, it's, it's, it's up to me, you know, and I, I like that. So, yeah, this in pros and cons, like, like, like people will say, I'm going to start a business or company because I don't want bosses. Well, no, you're not going to have one boss anymore. You're going to have like customers, vendors, on and on and on. Right. And then people will say, well, I, I don't know like my own company. I'm tired of working 40 hours a week. Well, no, no more 40 hours a week, like 60, 80, 90, you know? Yeah. And a true. lot of people don't get that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I sleep a little, um, I, I, you know, I worry about business a lot. I think about business. I'll get up in the middle of the night and you know, have an idea or a, a thought on how to make something better um, and, you know, get up, write about it, work on the computer a little bit. And um, fortunately, you know, my wife is, has been like hugely supportive. And mm -hmm. so I think that's a, a critical component. Of yeah. So let's talk about that real fast. You know, the importance of your, your spouse, close friends, family, what it could be being supportive. I'm not saying be supportive, not by, like, Oh, I support you do what you want to do, you know, but then they're sending like emails, sending you job, you know, job applications and making snot comments you've spent a hundred thousand dollars in three years. Nothing's coming in. What are you doing? Right. You know, like I actually, a spouse or someone actually supporting you. Right. How yeah. important that is. Oh, it's, it's everything. I mean, if, if you're married, um, and you don't have that spousal support, I, I mean, I, I think it's a non-starter, you know, I mean, how, you know, for me, my wife has really at, at certain times been the anchor, right. You know, she's had the health insurance for our family. She's had the steady income, right. Like when I, when I left my first company and was kind of trying to figure out what I was going to do, you know, she was the one that had the money coming in that, that really kept us in that kind of safe place. Um, and she's in marketing. So, you know, the truth is I win, win, right. Win, win. I'm able to, um, absolutely. My wife is huge. I mean, she's hugely helpful. That is, um, she's always got good ideas. She's always willing to put, um, some time and energy into, uh, what I'm doing. Um, she helps me write better. Um, because of her marketing skills. And so, you know, she proofreads a lot of things that I do. And, um, you know, and, and really she's, I think she believes in me. And I think that's, that's, that's big. that gives me a lot of momentum. And, and uh, you know, I wake up every day and I'm, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to accomplish things. And yeah, my family. So this is a big myth being an entrepreneur. Like it's all, you know, when the unicorns are rainbows, everyone's giving you money and everything. Yes. But the amount of times you hear, you hear no, you know, just the negativity all the time, right? I mean, how do you deal with the, all the negativity that you have to, you have to go with, you know? Sure. Um, I, I, I think you just have to have a short memory, you know? It's like playing golf, right? It's um, a good analogy. Yeah, I mean, you can you can have a really bad hole, and the next hole you can have a great, you know, great score. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I try not to focus on it. I mean, it's there, you know? I mean, there's days where you're terrified. You know this, too. You're just terrified. You're just so worried about things. and. Um, you know, but then you hit that high and you start getting that momentum and that traction. And, and, um, I think that's when you just really double down and, um, stay focused, you know? So, you know, as an entrepreneur, we get advice from tons of people, right? And I'll say most of it comes from a good place, right? But a lot of it, even though it's come from a good place, it's not, it's not good advice, right? Cause they're, yeah. they're giving you advice based on what they did back in 2012 or something that worked for them, you know, how you do with like, you know, decide, deciphering like good advice, bad advice and, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, I, I love feedback and, and I love negative feedback too. 
I mean, that is actually the best one, right? Yeah, when somebody's shooting, as long as it comes from a good place. Yeah, absolutely, right. As long as it's it's uh, yeah, it comes with a you know, it's it's good criticism, I think, as opposed to uh, somebody just beating you up. But um, that's something else I I got from the, the Marine Corps, and I think really growing up, you know, I was the youngest of like two boy or three boys, and and had a single mom for a while, um, and so really just that resiliency and and you know, developing thick skin, right? And having, you know, the ability, you, you have to be able to take it. You know, I know a lot of entrepreneurs that, that have great mentors that are giving them fantastic advice and they're just not willing to listen to yeah. it. You have to be humble, right? You, you have to be willing to learn. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think you take it, you know, you, you try and decipher, distill it out a little bit and figure out what, what, of, what parts of that advice are, are going to be beneficial, uh, what you can learn from and, and how you go forward. So next, next subject. So you're figuring out you want to be an entrepreneur and you're talking about sales. What makes someone a good salesperson? Uh, the ability to take no more than you hear. Yes, I think. Yeah. And, and, and I think really being um, unafraid, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to send emails and have somebody tell you no. And it's, I think it's really hard for a lot of people to pick up the phone and get hung up on <clears throat> yelled at. Um, don't call me again, don't harass me and, you know, all those sorts of things. And I think to, to really cut your teeth in sales, you know, for me, it started on the phone, mm -hmm. um, but I always enjoyed it. You know, like I, I just, you get that one yes out of 10 and, you know, you ring the bell and you, you know, you run around and you shout it, you know, tell everybody you can that you got this great deal going on. And um, yeah, that's, I, I really always enjoyed that kind of high that comes from, from success. And were you like training sales? You just learned it on your own. I mean, you know, basic. I think I started out it with Sprint, Sprint, mm -hmm. um, the telecom company, not PCS. Um, so they send you the training, but it's not really sales training. It's more product and and company knowledge training. Mm -hmm. um, I think the gift of gab, right? I mean, if, yeah. you, if you're willing to just like communicate and connect with people and be outgoing and and be friendly and and uh, have a tough mental attitude. Did you do any entrepreneurial stuff as a kid, like sell newspapers or mow lawns or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I wasn't the the child prodigy that, you know, everybody was like, hey, that guy's going to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, but I did, you know, cut some lawns here and there. And, and uh, you know, it's funny. I, my first job was at McDonald's. And, you know, my dad would get me out of bed at four in the morning. And I'd always work the, the morning shift on the weekends. And and uh, kind of getting in that groove of, mm -hmm. of responsibility as a young person, um, I think that was that was impactful you know, for me. And let's face it, it was a terrible job. So I, I mean, I learned early on. I was like, okay, I don't want to do this in life. So I need to figure out something that I can get. I can get yeah. around this. So talk about some of the challenges you have as being an entrepreneur. Yeah, um, you know, it's uh, staying the course, mm -hmm. right? Is it's prioritizing the important things. Um, it's learning how to not do everything um, and finding a way to delegate and building a team. Um, those are certainly challenges. Money is always a challenge, right? I mean, you start something new, you have to invest money. You know, who, who are you going to get to help you? Um, but fortunately, I've been able to like really connect with some great people um, along the way that have, that have definitely helped me. Um, good mentors and, and things like that, but um, it's all about execution, really, right? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, if you can have everyone's got great ideas, everything has to line up right, yeah, the perfect team, the perfect disc, and everything. And one other thing, nice off, then you're, you're pretty much fucked, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and executing, right? I mean, again, like we've all got great ideas, right? I have friends, family, lots of people tell me great ideas all the time, and that's all it is. Right. And so until you're able to really kind of encapsulate that idea and, and build that strategy that surrounds it and then execute on it. You know, it's oh, just, oh, just me. Someone will say, I have an idea. Have you done any like user research or customer research? Oh, no one's doing it. You a quick Google. Here's like 10 people doing the same thing. Sure. You know? Right. And they've all got a lot more money than you. Yeah. And smarter than you and everything else. Yeah. They have part of a board of advisors and blah, 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 blah. And you're like, right. Yeah. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, you are the time. You got to focus on marketing. You got to focus on sales. got to focus on tech. 
you got to focus on this other, other kind of stuff, right? But, but obviously, there's not enough time to focus everything, right? How do you decide day to day what to focus on? Yeah, good question. I think, um, you know, you need, to, you need to have a strategy and a plan, right? You have to have, you have to build a path. And then from there, you prioritize those things are, that are going to get you to MVP the fastest, I think. Um, those, you know, your, your runway in terms of money. You know, a lot of people don't think about that. And, you know, as they start investing their own personal money and then the money goes dry, um, you know, did they make the right moves along the way? And so I think, yeah, that's probably a couple of things. Um, yeah. So Nick, next question, which one of these are we going to drink first? What do we got here? All right. Um, the Buffalo Trace. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've tried the dark rye. You haven't? Okay. Yeah. We'll go with that first. Okay. Start there. We're going to pep things up here on the Jason right. Cabinet experience. I like it. I like it. Here, I'll pour you. And we're not sponsored by any of these, any of these bourbons. We're just having a little fun. All right. Well, cheers. Oh, it's tasty. That's tasty. Yeah. Thank you. Very, very nice. Very nice. So you're doing the entrepreneur thing. Are there any, any certain tools that you use? Well, let me backtrack. So one thing I think is entrepreneur people don't realize, like they know it's gonna, some entrepreneurs are going to take a long time, right? Like two, three, four years. Like the, the example I use all the time, you know, it took Apple like eight years to become Apple, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they interviewed Mark Zuckerberg like 2010 when the Facebook you know, first and the kind of quote made it. Mark, what's it like to be overnight success? Well, if your definition of overnight success is me coding in my dorm for six years, you have an overnight success, right? right. Don't get that. But I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't get either is how many people are going to come and go to your company when you first start, right? Because they have the same mentality, right? I'll work for the startup for six months. I'll be like stock options. And it's going to take a while, right? Mm -hmm. Have you, how, if you dealt with it, how have you dealt with people coming and going, right? Like working for you, not working for you. How have you dealt with that? Yeah. I mean, I think looking back at my first business where we had uh, 16 employees at one time, um, you know, it, it's, you try and find great people and you hope they stick around. You try and, you know, treat them right and build a good culture, but inevitably people do come and go um, for a variety of reasons, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's tough, you know, I mean, you, you, a lot of times you think you can compel people by paying them more or, um, you know, giving them more uh, benefits and things like that. Um, and the reality is it's just, it's, it's, you gotta, you know, entrepreneurs always need to remember it's your business. That's a great you point. Know? And, and as much as you love it, um, people have their own goals, yeah. you know? And, and so I think it's, it's tough, you know, I mean. Um, yeah. Too many entrepreneurs. How come employee X isn't all in like I am? Because it's not your company, you're probably paying them a little on and on and on, right? Sure. Even if even if you have a co-founder 50-50, it's your idea, right? They're gonna be all in as like you are, right? And people don't realize that. Right. Yeah. And that's I think it's um yeah, I mean, most recently I had uh I had a co-founder, he's an amazing guy. And, you know, we were I, you know, things were going really well and and you know, ultimately we ended up separating and he's got his own dreams and aspirations and you know, I look back, I think I made some mistakes with that, you know, and, and I, uh, uh, try and learn from it. That, that, that's one of the keys you have to, you have to be very honest about, uh, with yourself and with other people. And, and, um, you know, you just try and learn from your mistakes and, and, uh, do better the next time. Yeah. I have, I have a, a friend in the Bay area. He has a saying, well, all, all of us are not winners. Right. And I think that's true. Right. We're not all winners. We're not on the same level. Like in terms of you have a certain drive, certain focus, and everyone's not like that. Even other entrepreneurs on the same way what they call entrepreneurs or so to speak, you know? Sure. Sure. And so how do you, I mean, it's a, how do you surround, surround yourself with the right people? Do you have like a hiring process that you trust or like you just refer from friends? Like how do you go through that? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's funny. Um, you know, I think back on my first business, I, I definitely made the, the wrong hires more than one time. And it was funny. My wife helped me really come to this understanding is that I always hired people that I liked. Yeah. You know, I thought, well, this guy, he's a cool guy or she's a cool gal. And, you know, like we get along well and, and they're not qualified for that, but you know, we can, we can get them yeah. there or I can teach skills. They'll do something else. And, uh, 
you know, and a couple couple people that ended up working out, but most of the people it didn't, you know. And so then, you know, I had a really hard time firing those people too because I really liked them, mm -hmm. and so I would I would pivot them to different yeah. roles. Everyone says <laughs> fire fast, no one fires fast. Yeah, no, it's hard. I mean, you're, you're no one you're wants to be the bad guy. Somebody's life, you know, and, and their livelihood, and so and that's a good point. When people we hire people, a lot of people don't realize you're not hiring like employee, you're not hiring like Susan Jones. You're hiring Susan Jones and her family because now the whole family right. counts to you for your health benefits, you know, pay, mortgage. It's a whole family you're actually hiring. I don't think people think about that enough. Yeah, absolutely. I met an old boss and mentor of mine. Um, I remember he asked me one day, he's like, have you ever fired anybody? Neff, have you ever fired anybody? I said, no, I haven't. He said, well, you can't be a manager until you have. You know, and it took me a while to understand that. And, and then I had to fire somebody. And then he promoted me to, <laughs> to be a manager. Uh, but it was terrible. It was a horrible experience. Yeah. I, I, and I always say it, it's, 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 people think it's worse for the person you're fired. It's actually, if you're a good manager, a good boss, it's actually worse for you when you yeah. fire someone because you're thinking, how do I fail this person? What could I have done better? You know, you should have been more training, should have been this, should have been that, you know. And, and instead, it's like, no, well, the person got fired because the person put themselves in position to be fired. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, I think you have to do everything you can to try and help somebody succeed. Um, and if you've just hired the wrong person, mm -hmm. That's a different, that's a different sort of, or, or if they're doing something wrong or, or illegal or against company policy, those are different, Yeah, you know, and that, that's kind of the fire fast. Um, but you know, it's, it's a person and they've yeah. got, it's their livelihood. And we're looking at that too. Once you actually get, let someone go, you can just say, Hey, you know what? That, that's a, that's a quick, they can find a better opportunity for themselves, you know, and a quick, quick, you find someone to replace them too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think a lot of times, you know, people obviously take being fired very hard, Yeah, you know, and, Especially, especially it comes out the blue. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like on Monday, Jason, Jason Cavins, you're the best friends I have. Eight in the morning, you know, all your shit's packed up. You know, like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> exactly. This, you're not a culture fit. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I think, um, you know, another mentor taught me, like, nobody should be surprised they're being fired. And, and if they are surprised they're being fired, then you did them wrong. Yes. You, know, yeah. you didn't take them down the proper channels to try and help them do the job. You used to keep me in the army all the time when like in the army, people would say, you know, you know, we'll say Sergeant so-and-so is not performing. He's not doing this right. Well, have you told him? Well, what I, I don't, what I got time for, they know they're not doing right. Well, logic says if they knew they're doing wrong and messing up, they will fix it right. That's right. Yeah. But they're just doing the same thing over and over again. So like, what's going on here? Yeah. Is it because they're messing up or is it because you haven't told them, held them accountable, you know? Sure. And it happened all the time. I mean, it's the army. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the Marine Corps too. I mean, and I think that's just, that's bad leadership. You're doing them a disservice by, you know, we can't assume everything, right? I mean, like you walk into a, a target or something like that and, you know, you hear a consumer ask somebody a question and, you know, you're blown away by, by what they're asking. You're like, what do you mean? How do you open it? You twist the top off, right? And so, you know, you can only do so much so, sometimes. Mm -hmm. so. so totally random, right? You know, talking about customer service. So I'm under Chick-fil-A this morning, right? And Chick-fil-A always has a great user experience, right? So I go to the drive through I hear like, my pleasure, great day. What can I do for you? Please come again. It's like, customer service is so rare these days, I think, right? I mean, I think it's kind of bad that Chick-fil-A, a fast food, basically a fast food restaurant, is like the icon of customer service now, right? Right. Versus like maybe, and Starbucks, I think Starbucks is good too. But you think like, what happened to customer service? Like, and I think that's kind of part of the reason like all these like JC Penney's, Kohl's, and Sears are going out of business, right? I think customer service disappeared. I just yeah. think it's kind of weird that like Chick-fil-A is like the standard bearer for great customer service. And it used to be McDonald's, right? I mean, again, working at McDonald's when I was 16, you weren't allowed to say, is that it, mm -hmm. right? When the customer is that it? their order, is that it? Is that it? You're like, well, what else do you want me to order? Like, yeah, that's all I want, right? And so I've always prided myself and our, our, my companies on excellent customer service, right? Whether it's, it's in the service world, like we have a sales and marketing agency too. Um, you know, when our customer needs us, they need us and it's our job to be there, mm -hmm. right? And uh, in the product world, really it comes down to, if you're not putting a quality product out there, well, you know, you're not gonna be around long. Yeah. Um, but even if you have a quality product and you don't stand behind it with like a lifetime warranty, mm -hmm. you know, Patagonia, for example, I yeah. mean, you can have a jacket 10 years and if it rips, you can send it back and they give you a new one. It's mm -hmm. like, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Um, but I think going above and beyond and making sure that people are happy. You know, you want them to leave a good review, especially in the new digital world. Oh, yeah. I yeah, mean, definitely. if somebody wants to cancel you or, or start a fight, 
bring their army against your business mm-hmm. and because you don't treat them right. I mean, or, or everyone, everyone's influencer now, right? Everyone has like two, 1,200 people on Instagram, LinkedIn, whatever, you know? Yeah. And it, it gets out there. It's, yeah. It's your, your toes. Yeah. I mean, when we lived in, um, in Chicago, um, the power company ended up like, there was a weird billing thing that went down and my wife, because she's in the marketing and research world, uh, she found her way to the CEO's email. She couldn't get anywhere along the way with customer service. And of course it's big business, right? Yeah. So they weren't doing the right thing. I'm pretty sure he responded very quickly. On a Sunday, on a Sunday, she got an email from the CEO and said, my team will be in contact, please take it easy. Yeah. Right? So uh, yeah, I thought that that's a pretty incredible. That's pretty responsive. Yeah. So another random story. So I went to visit Dallas, man. I think last week it was two weeks. I have no idea about time to visit my, my, um, my grandson, my family, all that kind of stuff. So in the airport, airport flying back with some kind of restaurant in the airport. And I, and the customers were so bad. Right. And so me and the guy were talking to each other and the guys to ask the, ask the lady, uh, can I ask you where you're from? And she likes in, in Indiana. Yeah. I figure you're from Texas. You know, <laughs> yeah, because yeah, Texas don't don't do this. I figure from out of state, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, that was so so funny. Yeah. Congrats, by the way, on, oh, uh, on being a grandpa for the first time. Yeah. That's amazing. It's still kind of weird. Like I joke around. I get to take credit for something someone else did, right? There you go. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So back to your tent. How do you like? I mean, it's not a tent. Like you have to make decisions. Like what kind of material to use? What kind of like all these? Like what kind of like? What's the, the thing called the? Um, not the, uh, not the material, like the, the, the frame, like what kind of material the frame is that make out of? Sure. Like, how do you decide all this? Like, that's, I mean, I'm sure, pretty sure like, a, like one is more expensive, more is more durable, market production, all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. how does that all go? It seems yeah. like it's kind of complicated. Yeah, all the above, really. I mean, it's, um, you know, obviously you're, you're thinking about the price point, mm-hmm. right? How much are you going to sell your, your product for? Speaking of that, who's like your demographic for that? It's like, uh, Families, 25 to 35 with kids, four to six. Yeah. People like want to like, you know, hike the Appalachian Trail or like all the above. Yeah, no, not, not all the above. Um, it's definitely not a backpacking tent. Mm-hmm. It's, it's heavier than most. Um, and that's because of the, the spherical mm-hmm. nature of it. So it requires seven tent poles. Um, so anybody that's in the outdoor space understands that, you know, even if it's aluminum, seven tent poles is, and they're 11 feet long, by mm-hmm. the way. Um, that's quite a lot of material. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's a family camping, mm-hmm. car camping, uh, beach tent, mm-hmm. uh, camping tent, festival tent. Um, so our demographic is really probably, you know, 20 to 60, okay. I would say. Um, you know, we've got certainly customers, we think we'll have customers a little younger, but not, you know, it's, it's, it's not the cheapest tent out there. Um, and then, of course, certainly beyond 60 as well. But I, I'd say that's our sweet spot. Okay. Um, but yeah, when we're, when we're thinking about, you know, uh, product development and production, you know, it, it's, it's about kind of finding that, that price point in the market where you want to be. And that really dictates the material, um, aluminum poles, fiberglass poles, uh, super lightweight material, um, you know, more thick and durable material, kind of the use and all of those things. So we build that all into our product development. So I watched the, the Kickstarter video that you're going you're to push out. And I, I was kind of amazed that one of your points is like, it's um mosquito proof, right? Right. Aren't our tents mosquito proof? I, I, I thought... Well, so that's in kind of like getting feedback from a lot of mm-hmm. uh, potential consumers. So the tent opens up, right? Mm-hmm. And so if you're at the beach, it's open, you're kind of enjoying the sun. Um, and then incrementally it'll, it'll close. Mm-hmm. What people didn't really understand kind of in our early marketing was so if it's open and you close it then how do you stop the bugs from getting in okay and so the floor zips it zips completely closed now i mean if you close it and there's 100 mosquitoes in there yeah you're done there's still 100 mosquitoes in there um but you know most i think most instances you know if they're if you're in a really heavy bug area Mm -hmm. you're probably not going to open it up yeah you know you're just going to keep it all buttoned up um you know, it's nicely ventilated on top on the door as well. So, I mean, you get some air coming through when it's buttoned up, but. And does it come in different sizes or just one size? Just one size at this, at okay. this time. Yeah. And yeah, I believe the video says that it, it, it actually fits four people, two adults and two kids can comfortably be in there. No problem. I mean, we were going to call it a five person tent, mm-hmm. but there's really no market. There's yeah. no four or five person tents out there. Um, I think the common four person tent is like 
two people with gear okay. for a dog or something like that. Um, ours is genuinely, you could get four full grown adults in there. No problem with gear. I know you did uh, some user research on social media, like different colors. Yeah. What, what were the colors you put out there? What color, like quote unquote one, or is that still going on? Yeah, it's still going on. I mean, I think, um, it, it's, it's interesting because, you know, you always think that like, Hey, our favorite color is, yeah. is, you know, purple and gold, for mm -hmm. example. And, and that's just, that's just your opinion. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, that's another important thing I think as an entrepreneur in the product game, even in the service game is figuring out what other people like, not just assuming. Um, that's kind of an important thing. Um, I think right now, probably the color that's winning is, is blue and yellow. Uh, and a lot of people just kind of associate that the blue is the sky yeah. and the yellow is the sun. Now, does, does the cost of tank going to matter based on the price? I'm not based on the color. No, okay. not at all. Um, what we'll probably do, um, if everything goes according to plan is once we hit a, a, a revenue milestone mm -hmm. or a, a donation backer milestone, mm -hmm. um, is unlock a second color. So there's always MOQ, which is minimum order quantity. Mm -hmm. Um, and with that, you know, we need to order 500 tents. And so, and, and our tents aren't cheap, yeah. right? not, not, you know, for us to buy and for us to sell either. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll need to hit that threshold. And once we do, we'll probably unlock us uh, color choice number two. Now the tents, are they going to be handmade, like automated, made by robots? Or how is that, that process going to do? No, no robots. That'd be cool though. Um, basically it's, it's, um, you know, the way they make a tent is they'll create a pattern. And then essentially they'll, they'll lay it out on the material and then they cut it accordingly. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be cut and sewn by hand, um, not stitched by hand, mm -hmm. but you know, with machines, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then once they, you know, start putting these panels together, then they put tape sealing on them and that waterproofs the seams. Um, and then, you know, ultimately put the floor on it. And so for wa waterproof, is it waterproof, like up to like, you know, six inches of rain, a t a hurricane level water, or is this, how's that work? Yeah, it's it's a hydrostatic head is okay. the way they measure it. And ours is 4,000 millimeters. And that's based on like the amount of pressure that the rain mm -hmm. can apply. Um, so in the tent world, there's there's polyester tents, nylon tents, okay. um, uh, you know, other kinds of like heavier, thicker materials. Um, polyester is the better choice um, from a water standpoint. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's just, uh, and then it's got to be coated as well. Okay. And I'm going to presume like that's, Tents be made in China. I, I'm gonna presume that it's it's cheap, like to send a thousand tents over one time versus one at a time. Absolutely, yeah, definitely. I mean, so um, ideally, you're you're shipping a container, mm -hmm. um, which I think probably for our tent would be fifteen hundred tents, mm -hmm. maybe a couple thousand. So you fill up a whole container and you you ship the whole thing. Out. And they go from China. I suppose you have a thousand tents. Mm -hmm. Do those thousand tents go to the United States and then get shipped out individually to a thousand customers, or they or they come to another another like another holding place here in the United States and then ship out? Yeah, no. So it'll come in clear customs and then we'll put them into a, a 3PL, um, a third party logistic warehouse, and then essentially connect our software, you know, from our website and and through Kickstarter into there, and then. Um, We'll ship them one at a time or hope, you know, maybe people want to buy two at a time and we'll ship them two at a time. So your Kickstarter goes, and we'll talk about this more detail in a minute, but your Kickstarter goes live, goes live May 13th, right? May 13th. Can you, and I'll talk about this some too. Can you talk about some of the pros and cons of doing the Kickstarter, like the, the amount of work, you know, just the whole headache with that, or maybe it's not a headache? No, I mean, it's, you know, they're, they have a pretty phenomenal platform, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think much of a headache per se. Um, I think the amount of work you have to do uh without having a yeah you don't just with, post you just don't post something buy my tin and me and people buy it no right? you no you don't i mean it, it, it's an expensive endeavor and there's two ways to do it there's the right way and the wrong way right yeah. <laughs> so um yeah it, it's kind of the the unknown you know I've, I've never really had that fear of the unknown it's kind of exciting to me but at the same time you know we've invested a lot of money in this mm -hmm. and so in time i'm sure in time yeah absolutely and so you need to make sure that you've you know you've got the the following in place that people are motivated by the product. You know, you've got that product. Get the community up and that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and then I think you, you know, you make sure you do everything properly ahead of time. Um, once the campaign goes live, you know, you're, you're kind of in the abyss at that mm -hmm. point, you're in the deep end of the pool. There's, there's no turning back. It's on your baby's out there for the world to see. 
you know, and you just hope everybody. That's the thing about doing a crowdfunding a Kickstarter. You're, you're you're out there for the world to see, right? Yeah. Your products up. You're out. You're out there. I mean, you got you got to put John Neff out there. Your personality. You know, your co-founder, the team. Yep. I mean, it's, there's no hiding, right? There's no. This you're all you're out there for everyone to see. Yeah. And, and to be criticized or praised, for the case may be. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting. So, um, our social media team. Somebody had posted a negative comment recently. Um, and they took it down. And, you know, I, I noticed that the comment had been taken down mm-hmm. and we put it back up and yeah. then, and then we addressed it, you yeah, know? So it's like, do, yeah. you know, I don't want to hide from people's feedback mm-hmm. and, and the critique. I want to address it. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have to know it's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy that's doing the Appalachian trail is not going to take my product. Yeah. Um, well, hopefully he doesn't take it right. <laughs> hopefully <laughs> it's going to be a long walk. Yeah. It definitely his life, his more, life is going to suck. It definitely weighs more than, you know, a backpacking tent. Um, but I think over all these years, I've I've learned, you know, like people love certain brands and people mm-hmm. people hate certain brands, and uh, there's always going to be the people, the naysayers, mm-hmm. and so you just have to you have to find the people that are supportive of it. And um, you know, I think I've got a lot of a lot of friends, a lot of family um, that are ready to support the campaign. A lot of people on social media. I mean, um, my friend Rue, who I basically bought the design from, and then and then over the last couple of years, he and I redesigned it. Um, and, and really evolved is a better way to put it. Um, you know, I mean, he had, there's a lot of people that have been waiting for this tent. They've seen some video footage of it. And so we're, we're excited. We think it's going to go well. Is the tent actually made already? Like you already have like a hundred that made already? Are you, are you not going to make them to you have like have the, or the orders come in? Well, so backing up a couple of years, we were going to launch in 2019 and um, some things with my other business happened. And so I wasn't able to, to launch. Um, in 2020, we were going to launch beginning of the year, uh, but we got our kind of our final sample. Mm-hmm. Um, and basically the, the uh, manufacturing process had changed unbeknownst to us. And so it would have required quite a few thousand mm-hmm. more dollars. And so okay. we were like, okay, we need to park this and then COVID hit. Okay. And so uh, no, we're working with, with uh, pre-production samples mm-hmm. right now. And so waiting on our final sample and then, you know, we've had a lot of people ask like very specific details. And so we'll be, we'll be releasing that over the next 30 days. So let's go back to China for a minute. Something I forgot to ask you. What are mistakes you see people making when they do business in China? Uh, to me, number one is not going. You have to be there. You have, I, I you have to show, so. show face, right? You got to be, make a, okay. I think so. To I, me, mean, that I, makes I sense. think that, you know, as, as a business, it's a partnership, really. Mm-hmm. When you start working with a factory, I mean, you need to, you need to create that partnership. Um, and I think, when you do that, you make that effort to go there, to eat their food, mm-hmm. you know, to go to dinner with them, you know, you're building a, that's the foundation of the partnership. Uh, and again, I know some people that have never been to do business there. Yeah. I can and, imagine. And, and, you know, really then you're putting your, your business in someone else's hands and half to, the, to half, me, that's half the world scary. away. That's pretty scary to not know who, the, who you're doing business with. And um, so, yeah, I think that's probably number one. I think number two, I've seen a lot of, Westerners kind of pound their fist on the table and scream and yell at the, at the factory worker, you know, your, your sales contact or your mm-hmm. person you're working with. And, and you know, that's kind of the Western way, mm-hmm. you know, if, you, if you're not getting what you like, you scream about it. Um, that's not the Chinese way at all. Yeah. And, and I think um, it's, a, it's a, it just doesn't make for a good partnership. And so I've, I've seen that. That's probably number two. Um, and number three is assuming everything's going to be cheap. Yeah. You know, I mean, unless you're in the cheap product space, Mm -hmm. plastic cups or something, for example, um, you have to, you really have to know kind of what the the composition, the bill of materials is for your product. So it's great for you. Like when I was in the army in Korea, you know, we just did all this like like high level exercise in Korean military. And every time we we, we have to go, we have to go drink with them. Right. I mean, anything is like, and it's a lot of, they drink, like it's a lot of drinking, right? Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing with the Chinese. You like you're gonna do some drinking for you to get, get down to business. You're gonna do some drinking for sure. Um, yeah, I've had some very bad long nights in China. Uh, there, it's always fun, of course, but um, yeah, and, and really in the very beginning too, um, they want you to try what they like, mm-hmm. right? And so oftentimes it's not the drinking; it's sometimes it's the food. Yeah. That they want that they're, back. They're pushing on you and yeah. they're like, Hey, try this intestine. And you're yeah. like, No, I'm good. I don't need intestines. They're like, No, you have to try. Take us out of this this um ox blood or something yeah, crazy. Exactly. And so you end up, you know, you do it because you're you're building that rapport mm-hmm. and that trust. Um 
fortunately, I, I work with a lot of the same people, <laughs> so I've passed my test. Yeah, so I, you passed that point. I, yeah, I don't really have to do the, uh, you know, the the ox blood snake <laughs> venom anymore. So I'm, I'm over that. Yeah, that, that's crazy. Um, so back back to sales real fast. When did you realize that you were good at sales, or at least you could, you know, good enough to know get customers, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I to me it was it was kind of a challenge. People just kept saying, "Hey, you should be in sales." Mm -hmm. Like, are you in sales? You should be. You're good at sales. You should be in sales. I was like, "All right, well, you know, it's like if if enough people tell you you're you're good looking and you should be in the movies, yeah. like, all right, I'm going to be a movie star." Um, I never got that, but. Um, <laughs> Um, I think really then once I got into it and, and I was able to kind of overcome that, that, that scared mentality of being in sales, um, I knew then that I would, that I would be in a good place. You know, it's funny in my first company too, I remember, um, literally driving around in a truck, you know, with hammocks in the back of this thing and going up to, like to an ACE hardware or anywhere that, that we thought they might be interested in our hammocks. Mm -hmm. And this one time in particular, we pinned the, you know, the store manager in the corner and, you know, whip out the hammock and, you know, look at this, They're showing them all this stuff. This is the greatest thing ever. You got to try them. And then the guy looks at me and he says, if I buy your product, we you leave my store. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. And, and he wrote us a check right there on the spot, like literally handed us a check and we ran directly across the street to the bank and cashed it. Nice. And I was like, yeah, man, like, if, if we can do that, all we have to do is go to a thousand more stores. Um, and that was kind of the mentality, you know, it's just, yeah, that's a good point. I think that's so crazy. I think entrepreneur, like you hear no all the time, you might hear like a hundred no's, like, like, like not no, but hell no, fuck no, no way in hell. But some might say, I'll think about it. And then like, that makes your day, right? Yeah. He, he might, he might buy my product yeah. and then just motivates you to keep on going. Right. But I learned that guy, the, the maybe, or I'll think about it was the guy I was always most afraid of. That's true too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just tell me no. Tell me no. Tell me you'll uh, you'll buy from me and yeah, I'll leave. That's a good point. Yeah. Or don't. Because then you waste time Just going back to, to get and then you waste your time going back to the maybe. Exactly. So he I, has no I, intention of buying. Yeah, I think it's important to get to that, get to yes or get to no, mm -hmm. and then you know move along. And then and then bug them again in a month. Yeah. If they say that's no. a good point. Like you, you you're like doing sales or whatever. You're, you're selling some product, and like you send emails calling. They never. The, the question is, how often do you follow up? Like how often do you follow up before you think you become annoying? I have I have another one guy I follow on social media named Sally FT has a company, a sales company for starters called Close Dot Close Dot Con. His thing that he follows when he says no. His story is like he followed up an investor nine, no, not nine, like 97 times. Wow. The investor finally answered 98 times and said, Hey, thank you. I've been busy, family emergencies. That's talking about me investing, right? So mm -hmm. I mean more than 98. So this, you know, he called, emailed 90 times for this person finally investing, right? Yeah. So from your point of view, how often do you follow up before you're like, okay, I'm wasting my time or, or, or you know, new things or that like, hey, kind of tough stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think there's kind of the the old way and the new way. The new way is LinkedIn where somebody like badgers you and hits you with a, you know, a LinkedIn every single day they're trying to sell you something. Yeah. And then pretty soon you just like cut the connection because you can't, yeah. you just can't take the scam, yeah. right? Um, I think you need to be respectful, mm -hmm. um, but you need to be persistent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I always think like, the people that I'm trying to work with and sell to, they don't, they don't owe me anything. Yeah. You know, so I, I try and keep it like, I don't want to cross the line and yeah. be that guy. Um, you know, but I, it's funny. I used to tell my, my sales guys, like, if you have a customer that buys from you and, and it's funny, it's like, a, I, I use a weird analogy, right? It's like, if you have a girlfriend and your girlfriend stops returning your calls or picking up the phone, She's not your girlfriend anymore. Yeah, that's a good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> and I used to tell my sales guys, like, if your customer isn't calling you back or returning emails or communicating with you, then you have to assume it's not your customer, mm -hmm. you know, because they would always show me like their, here's my customer list, here's a report, here's an update or whatever. And I'd be like, well, these 10 people you haven't communicated with. Ah, yeah, it's all good. And it's like, well, it's been four months. Yeah, that's a long yeah, time. That's a long time. And so I think then you just have to either, you know, cut bait or you know, figure it out. So for your tent, is there going to be any um, add-ons? Like, um, I can't think of the term, like when you buy something. The rewards. No, not the rewards. Like, like suppose like you, like you buy a glass and then, you know, 
you, you buy the glass for five dollars and then a month later you sell them like you, you sell them like a smaller glass for two dollars right i can't think of the term it is like not add-ons but um you know what i'm talking about right yeah like um like creating lifetime value yeah like, yeah, yeah yeah um like you you are you about to sell a tent and then like maybe sell i don't know like a bigger foam mattress for the tent or yeah for sure so during the campaign um we're, we're going to have add-ons, of course. Like, add-ons, uh, add-ons, that's what it's yeah. add-ons. Add Hats, um, stickers, we're doing like some reusable bags, you know, so when you go to the grocery store, um, kind of playing along that same, like planting trees mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just, um, which is something I can talk about in a minute, but um, uh, you get a backpack with it, you get the rain fly with it. Um, we're going we're gonna to add some solar lights inside of it and just some other cool little add-ons. Um, but as, as our, our product development roadmap goes, yeah, I mean, we've got, probably five more products basically lined up to come behind the tent mm -hmm. and kind of our, our, our whole thought is really, it's like, okay, you've got a tent, right. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, whether you're camping or at the beach or at a festival, what else do you need to go with your tent? Right. So for us, it's like, okay, we need a cooler. Mm -hmm. Right. So we've got a, we've got a, a backpack cooler mm -hmm. that's coming out. Um, we've got and all this will be made in China, uh, China or Vietnam. Vietnam. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, either, either one. Uh, it, we're looking to do some American made stuff, mm -hmm. but it's tough right now. Um, it's a lot more expensive. And, and so we're kind of working on that supply chain side of things, but um, definitely have more products coming out. So, so if someone buys a tent from you, right? What's, what's the process after them? Like, how are you going to follow up with them? Make sure they they like the tent. Like what's going to be the user experience for someone who buys a tent? Sure. Well, of course it's going through Kickstarter in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, basically, you know, I think a lot of feedback will come through social media. Excuse me. Um, and ideally then really kind of uh, once we're off of the Kickstarter platform uh, on our, our direct to consumer website um, and basically uh, looking for good reviews. Um, and that's, that's where a lot of that feedback comes in, but, you know, essentially just following up with them. Um, you know, we want to know that people are satisfied with mm -hmm. our product and, you know, we stand behind it. And so if there's issues, then we'll be happy to address those issues as well. Yes. And your company's headquartered in Seattle. Right now it is, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so you you have more than one company. I do. And so let's talk about this for a minute. It's like, so there's a lot of people out there, and nothing wrong with it. A lot of people that are like working nine to five, they can be able to handle work working nine to five, you know, and you know what the case would be. But you're the CEO of three companies. Yep. Like I mean, I, I you know, that's that's a lot, right? It is. And like you no know, people like say, you know, Elon Musk has all this stuff going on, time management, you know. Like talk about time management, focus. And first of all, like I know Elon Musk, he works like Three days one company, three days another company, another day like quote unquote family time. He works hundred hour weeks. So I'm gonna throw a lot of stuff right now. Like, you have three companies. Do you like, you know, work hundred hours a week? Do you like balance that out? Do you wing it? Like, how do you do all this stuff right? I mean, the three companies is a lot. It is, yeah. And and really, um, so Compo is is pre-revenue, mm -hmm. right? So we've never sold a, a product, right? So this is like just a lot of work um leading up to. Um I was encouraged to not do compo this year, but you know, I feel like I've been sitting on it for a little while mm -hmm. and uh, there's no expiration date on the tent, but you know, I, I want to be first to market mm -hmm. and I, I want to do it this year. I mean, uh, the outdoor industry has had a phenomenal, phenomenal 2020 in spite of the pandemic. A lot of people are getting outside. Uh, we're all stir crazy. We want to be, you know, in the outdoor space where we don't have to wear a mask and we can, you know, set distance ourselves from other people. Um, so that was a bit of a timing thing, right? It just, I felt like it needed to happen. Um, our sales and marketing agency um, is really, our, you know, how we, how we making money. That's Traction Bridge. Traction Bridge. That's right? Traction Bridge. That's right. Yep. Um, and then um, launching uh, a wholesale B2B marketplace, uh, focusing on uh, the outdoor sector, uh, outdoor lifestyle, sporting goods sector. And so uh, with Compo, like, really swelling up and getting big the last month in terms of output of energy. Um, you know, you have to find that balance. I mean, I'm certainly not Elon Musk um, in any way at all, uh, but I do like his, his approach, right? Where you basically kind of divide your time and you're disciplined about it. Uh, you know, and so you work on uh, company A one day or one hour, right? And so you break your time up. And for me, it's, it's, um, I was working with a, uh, like a, a business coach for a while. And I, and I think that's important too, for people to realize is, is there's a lot of help out there in a variety of ways um, and, and kind of uh, types of help. And so 
the focus with that that particular coach was um, uh, priority management. So not kind of like time and priority management, right? So focusing on the biggest and most important things and and kind of letting the other things just be, you know, and, and delegating that stuff off. Um, and that, that was really beneficial for me. I mean, I, I, I thought that was a great way to kind of approach things. And so I think that's important. So Tracker Bridge is like your, your like a core business, so to speak, like your marketing. And who do you do? Who, like who does Tracks and Bridge serve? Like who your, who's your customer for them? Yeah, sure. So we work with um, pre-pandemic, um, you know, and I was in that Founders Institute program. Um, and really kind of the, the whole idea was that there's, there's 4 million plus factories in China. And I, you know, through all my time working there, realized that that a lot of the ways that companies kind of approach the the entering the U.S. market is is through price, mm-hmm. right? And and that always results in the race to the bottom, and and that's a dangerous place to be, right? Like we all do our business to make money, not yeah. lose money. And so, you know, I kind of identified that as a niche that was was uh, worth going after. And so, because of my connections and all the factories I know and the brands that I know in China. I thought, hey, that'd be that'd be a great place to to take this startup company and kind of go after. Um, and really, you know, we manage their Amazon business, their social media business, their direct to consumer business, um, and uh, yeah, when the pandemic happened, you know, I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to sustain. I didn't know if there were going to be ships going across the water or, or factories were going to be you know producing product. Nobody knew what was going on. And so we basically pivoted and, and started kind of targeting U.S.-based customers as well, brands, um, because it doesn't matter where you're from. You know, you go to a trade show, you spend your twenty or thirty thousand uh, dollars, you put your beautiful products out there in your beautiful booth and your great brand, and you talk to five people and nobody buys anything. And that's like very, it's very common in, in the trade show space, right? Um, trade shows have become more of a marketing kind of a. a project where people like to, you know, drink and hang out and, and have fun. And, you know, for the young company that's very serious and they're, they're there to write orders mm-hmm. and orders aren't being written. Right. And so um, I kind of put all that 20 years of knowledge together and was like, man, I, there's, this has got an idea. It's a great idea. And so, um, yeah, that's Traction Bridge. Um, so it was back to the tent. Your 10 X has a patent for it, right? It does. Can you yep. talk about the process of getting a patent? You know, was it hard, expensive? Why even do a patent and, and this, doing the patent? Do you think that's to be like a business multiplier for the tent? Sure. I think, you know, from a business multiplier standpoint, having any IP um, to support a company or a product is definitely makes the product worth more money from an investor's eye or a, a potential acquirer from, you know, where they're sitting. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like, it's, it's safe. Um, yeah. I, I think that it used to be difficult. To get patents and and it's not cheap i mean you definitely have to pony up some money you know you're paying an, an attorney um you can do it yourself but um, but why but why i mean i don't have that kind of time and you know i'm not a lawyer and i don't like reading contracts and documents and things like that so um yeah i mean i think finding attorneys in those kind of niche pieces of your business are, are really critical and how long is the process from to the the idea of the patent to actually getting it approved. Yeah. So there's, there's basically like the, the research, um, the application, and then basically you wait like a year, okay. right? It, it's kind of in this, um, in the USPTO's hands. And so then they say, Hey, cool. You're good to go. And then you pay your attorney more money. Um, and he of does, course. and he or she does whatever they do. And then ultimately you, you get your, uh, your, you know, it's patent pending. So what happens like you apply for a patent, we'll say February, 2022, mm-hmm. and three months later, someone else applies for the patent because they don't know you applied for one. Mm-hmm. Do they get kicked back because you already applied for it or? Yeah, it's for it's first come first. Right? Okay. And so, you know, that's why it's important. You know, you don't take your product to market before it's patented. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't, you don't talk to, you don't make it known to everybody. I mean, mm-hmm. if you really want to protect it, right, mm-hmm. you need to, you need to do um, all those things. But then again, I mean, um, we used to have a beach blanket and it was patented and all somebody and it had a, this connected pouch where you would stuff it inside of the mm. beach blanket. So all people would have to do, because if you want to patent all these different applications, you have to pay more money, yeah. right? You patent this. Okay. You pay that. Well, you patent this little piece for it. Okay. It's an add on essentially. 
uh, and it's expensive for a young company. And so um, typically what people do is they just the bare minimum, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you, again, you're a big company. Yeah. Um, and then somebody changes it. I think it's, I forget, I think it's 18%. You alter it. Mm -hmm. And so now the only difference between, you know, my beach blanket and theirs is their pockets not connected. Okay. But they put a different pocket where you can stuff your stuff pouch in, you know, and they sell it for cheaper. Right. And so, um, and the other thing with patents is too, I mean, if, if you're going to pony up all the money to, to protect your product and somebody wants to knock it off, then you have to be able to willing to defend your patent, which is more money, which is more, more lawyer fees. Yeah, exactly. I think the lawyers like that, but I'm sure they do. <laughs> Some kind of conspiracy. Yeah. So your next company is is is, is it skew skew candy? Skew candy. That's right. Yeah. But first question, like, was Traction Bridge first and Skew then Compo, or how they how did they no order Compo go? was first, um, then Traction Bridge, um, and when I was in Founders Institute, um, you know, here in, I, I basically went through FI because I you know I started my first company, I bootstrapped it. Um, it took a long time to figure out things. And, and I thought, man, in this new world of technology, um, you know, what am I missing? And, and I'm sure there's new things to learn. And, and what I learned is there's not, you know, it's the same. It's execution. It's strategy. It's, you know, it, starting a company in 1900 was very similar to starting a company in, in yeah. 2021. Um, but the great experience was I was in this room full of like, you know, cryptocurrency guys and fintech and SaaS and like, mind-blowing ideas right like hyper smart people and none of them were making money mm -hmm. right i'm the only one in the room making money and that but i'm the only one in the room with no technology and they all have technology right so i'm looking at them and i'm like man where'd you guys get all this technology and they're like how do you make money like you actually make money like you what do you, you your business is so basic like how do you make money and you know i would always joke with them it's block and tackle yeah you know I, we do what people have done for decades, centuries, probably. Um, but I was always looking for that piece of technology, right? Working with the mentors. And, and so um, that's kind of where Skew Candy came from. It's like an evolution of Traction Bridge. Um, one of our customers had asked me like, hey, do you think you could, you could help us get into retail? And I was like, of course I can, right? So, you know, I, I busted out my earpiece and I sat down and, and I made a list of retailers and I started calling them. And at the end of the day, I was like, oh man, that was hard work. It was exhausting. Like basically I was a sales rep again mm -hmm. and I knew I didn't want to be a sales rep again. So I was like, all right, I need to, I need to find a way to turn this into a technology play. And so really with the rise of wholesale marketplaces, um, that's kind of where the idea came from. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our slogan is where brands meet buyers. Okay. And that's really the goal, right. Is to, is to bring a bunch of brands that are having a hard time going to market. Uh, maybe they're new, maybe they're from Europe or, or Asia. And then essentially, you know, find the big pool of, of U.S. buyers and really global buyers. Um, and then, you know, essentially marry them together on a, on a beautiful platform that's got great user experience. And then, you know, we, we take a cut, essentially. So talk about the names of your company. All these random names, they mean something. Can you talk about the process of naming your companies? Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's funny. In my very first company, we started naming all of our products. And so like all of these products lived under this brand that wasn't really a brand and our product names were better than our brand name. <laughs> and so uh, kind of a goofball way to go about it. But um, Compo is uh, camping in Spanish or, okay. or field. And so it's kind of like, you know, camping designs or field designs. Um, and I, I kind of like that, you know, Spanish, English mm -hmm. kind of a hybrid name. Um, so we went with Compo Designs. Traction Bridge is, um, in the beginning, it was called EGN, which is my first son's initials, mm -hmm. sales and marketing. Um, but really, we didn't, that's not much of a brand, mm -hmm. right? And so we, uh, we came up with Traction Bridge because, you know, thinking about kind of the bridge between us and Asia okay. initially. Oh, man, right? yeah. And then like helping companies create traction was, okay. was, was that's a goal. good one. Yeah. And then uh, Skew Candy. Um, kind of an interesting way I, I came up with the name. I mean, like I really wanted to have a dot com. And you know, anybody that searched for dot com names, I mean it's kind of hard. GoDaddy now. owns like every yeah. cool name on the planet, right? And if it's not GoDaddy, it's some guy in his basement that yeah. owns every other cool name. And so it's it's pretty tough to come up with names. Um and SKU of course is like the acronym for uh, stock keeping unit. Okay. Right. Like so a, a SKU at a store. Um 
And, and I just like, I don't know, I thought, you know, hey, we've got all these cool products and these cool brands. Like our SKUs are like candy, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like SKU candy. So that was, that was the inspiration there. All right. So next, it's time for another bourbon break. All right. So Buffalo Trace or the Knob Creek? Uh, let's go Buffalo Trace. That's, uh, okay. I used to fly United Airlines all the time, and that was, that was their, uh, I did not know that. their onboard bourbon. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it is still, but. Thank you, sir. So what's the goal for the Kickstarter? I mean, obviously, you know, like you want to raise a certain amount of money, but is another goal, like, you know, like brand awareness, like a certain number of people to hit the website or like maybe potential investors. Yeah. I mean, um, it's a monetary goal is, is, you know, I mean, like we basically want to fund the first 500 units uh, going mm-hmm. to production. Um, so really, if I were to throw a number out there, I would say, um, I mean, I could do 300, excuse me, but I think 500 is a better place to be, you know, so we're talking 55, $60,000. Um, so that would be ideal. Um, but that's not really our goal. Mm-hmm. You know, it's funny. If you ask my wife, she would tell you, your goal is 250. Calm down. And I'm like, no, it's 2 million. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to aim high. Yeah. People don't realize that. And when you do a Kickstarter, a crowdfunder, there's like the public goal. It's a one amount. It's kind of, they actually tell you to keep low, mm-hmm. but then of course there's an internal goal. Like, like the public goal might be, you know, 25,000, but the real goal is like 2 million. Right. Yeah. I mean, I want to be the highest funded tent ever. Yeah. That That's my goal. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's, that's kind of how I dream and think, mm-hmm. you know, I always think big and it doesn't mean I always accomplish big, mm-hmm. but I'm like a, I'm a dreamer for yeah. sure. Um, I think beyond that, yeah, definitely brand awareness. I'd love to see the video go viral. Um, I just was in Cancun down in Tulum with a good friend of mine. Uh, he was an amazing videographer and, and photographer and, and you saw the video today. Mm-hmm. I mean, the video is pretty, pretty epic. It's pretty nice. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really going to be impactful and people will appreciate it. Um, so brand awareness, certainly. And then really just to, to give Compo the, the traction and momentum that we need to live off of Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't really plan to sell to retail. I mean, I've got some retail buyer owners. So you plan friends. on being direct to consumer for the, for the whatever, how long the company lasts? I think so. I mean, there's some select retailers that I would certainly work, you know, if REI calls, mm-hmm. I'll probably work with them. Yeah, you definitely got to take their call, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, but really even some, some really marquee specialty outdoor retailers that I, that I would work with and, and I would take less margin mm-hmm. because they're, you know, they're the kind of stores that if you're, if you're working with them, people just really perceive your brand to be because they only work with great brands mm-hmm. to be a great brand. Um, and then really kind of launch us into that, that um, again, that traction and momentum to where we can, we can bring in more products mm-hmm. behind, behind the tent. Yeah. So your vision for the company is pretty much like be the number one tent company in the world. In, in, I think to be the most unique Mm -hmm. tent company in the world, certainly, um, you know, that's a Coleman's pretty big. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure we're trying to take down Coleman, uh, but maybe you say you you like to dream big, right? I do like to dream big, you know, maybe Coleman would want to, uh, invest or buy Mm someday. That would be great. You know, and I've already had some, some licensing, um, people call me that want to license the product out. Um, but I, I, I really want to take this thing and, and run with it for a while. Mm-hmm. We've put a lot of time and, you know, it's kind of my baby now. So how long does it take to build one tent? What's the process for that? You mean at the factory? Yeah. Um, it's pretty fast or. I mean, I think they're, they could crank out 30 a day. A day okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you're talking about a two person mm-hmm. small tent with two tent poles, I mean, they're, they're probably cranking thousands, you know, hundreds a day. Um, so you've been an entrepreneur for like what, 20 years you... since two, yeah, 20 years since 2001. So it's safe to say that you'll only way you ever work for someone else. They pay like an ungodly amount of money. Right. And probably even not even probably in the end, the answer will probably know. Right. I mean, it depends if my wife knows that the, <laughs> the conversation is <laughs> going on. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, um, I remember when I was kind of in between and, and it stresses my mom out. Right. Mm-hmm. She's it's very stressful for me to be an for her for me to be an entrepreneur, yeah. right? Um, because she worries, right? And she just doesn't understand. Like she thinks you'll be homeless tomorrow or something yeah, like that. Yeah, she's worked her whole she you know, she worked her whole life. Mm-hmm. So it just doesn't 
she was never an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially minded person. Um, and so I remember we were talking and she said, you know, we moved back here to, to Seattle and she said, honey, why don't you just go work at Boeing? And I was, conversation, and yeah. I was like, do you even know me? Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? I'm unhirable. Like I can't go get a job. Like, I don't even know. It would be really strange for me. I mean, and, and I appreciate, I mean, obviously people are, have jobs. That's mm -hmm. how it works. Right. Um, and I just think I've been, I've been hanging out in the wind for so long. And I think it's not that, that we're unhirable, but if we work at we a regular job at Amazon, Boeing, Microsoft, I mean, name the company. First thing we do, we're going to go there first day and we're going to try to figure out how to make things better. Right. Right. And you make things better. You step on people's toes. Right. Bureaucracy. And that's where our people, entrepreneurs are hire because we try to make things better, add value. And you know, that's not the way to do, right. You got to know. Yeah. I, yeah. I just, I don't know, like the whole thought of, um, and it's interesting in my first business week, we were really flexible with people, you know, I mean, really like there was no time clock because like I couldn't adhere to a time clock. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we were, I think we were kind of on the, the cutting edge of culture mm -hmm. and we didn't understand it to be culture. We just thought like, I mean, man, we're not here at nine. How can we tell you? To be here yeah. That was, it was a really a, kind of a, a hippie attitude toward a, running a business, I guess, um, is a good way to put it. But I don't know. It scares me. Like having a job scares me. I'll be honest, like having to get up and go to work. But then I also think about how lucky people are that, you know, they don't, they're not up at night. No. A lot of people thinking about their job and worrying about their job. They cut off at 5 p.m. Cut off at 5, Saturday and Sunday. Binge on Netflix, doing, you know. Doing your thing, you know, you're not, you know, trying to get up early and grind a little bit in the morning and then grind a little bit at night. And, and um, yeah, so I think it's, um, I don't know. I guess if there's one thing I'm afraid of, it's getting a job. So a lot of people talk, like you said, a lot of people talk about, you know, you know, get a job secure. But I think time and again, again, like, you know, the, 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 the dot com bust of 2001, the great recession 2008, COVID 2020, you know, jobs are not secure, right? I mean, there's at real employment, yeah. they can get rid of you for any reason, any time. So, so how really secure is that versus being an entrepreneur, right? These entrepreneur, if you make or lose money, it's on you, right? Right. But a job, they could, you know, whatever reason, you know, and of course, it's not like illegal, right? You like, you know, kind of like unlawful, but, right. you know, our, our revenue went down 10%, we have to get rid of 10% of people, right? Yeah. I mean, it's really no secure job, you know? Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if much of anything is secure anymore. Right. No. And so, um, yeah, I I'd rather put, I'd rather, you know, if to use like a weird, like gambling analogy, black or red. Right. I mean, I'd rather put my money on me. Yeah. You know, then, then. And what's the good point? So many people do not want to put the money on themselves. Yeah. So many people don't have you know confidence in themselves and they really put the money, not putting any money, anything, right. They just want to go with the flow, but yeah, you got to put your money on yourself as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. So back to the Marines, let's talk about a bunker labs of veterans residence for a reason. Sure. For, so got the bunker labs cup. Yep. Veteran residence cup. That's why I wear my camouflage hat today. <laughs> so we, we're both like, oh, well, um, I always say city leader, that right term is actually what city ambassador, right? Right. But I think, you know, I'm kind of stuff. I always say city leader. I'm just, you know, right. built that way. So we both, you know, volunteer for Bunker Labs. So those who don't know, Bunker Labs is a national nonprofit. That's our military veterans. When I say military veterans, like all like spouses, dependents, community, mm -hmm. dark companies, like there's a lot of, a lot of nonprofits that help, you know, help us, you know, like with medical stuff, find jobs, PTSD, but really nothing help us, you know, start companies. Right. So we're both, both involved with that. I think the stats show, I'm making this up, after World War II, 80% of veterans started companies, like 5%. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I say, with veterans, we're in this bubble, right? Like I'll use Fort Lewis, for example. When I said Fort Lewis, I never came to Seattle, right? Like I had no reason, right? Well, first of all, I didn't have the time, right? Because for basically six to six, six every day, you know, being the Army stuff, right? Right. So we, we did a lot of networks and stuff to help people start companies. Talk about the, the, your experience with Bunker Lab so far. Yeah, I mean, I think Bunker Labs is a is a great organization uh, uh, with a great goal, right? I mean, uh, and you're right. And World War II, uh, the number of veterans that were starting businesses and really kind of building that backbone of America, uh, the numbers were so much higher than they are now. Um, and really, a lot of a lot of military people have the skill set, right? They understand what it's what it's like to give up everything and to you know to basically focus on that task 100 percent of the time. And so it's kind of in our, our DNA, really. Um, but Bunker Labs has been fantastic. You know, I went through a cohort, you know, I had to interview with you and, and I was super excited. I mean, man, I was, I was like amazing. I can work at WeWork. 
uh, I can get back into the veteran ecosystem and, and the entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, find some motivated people to be around. We had just moved back to Seattle. Um, and I was kind of away from the veteran community mm-hmm. for a while. I lived in Chicago and <clears throat> really Bunker Labs is, is founded in Chicago, mm-hmm. but I didn't know, I didn't know a single veteran when I lived there, you know, all my friends were just friends that I kind of met through, uh, like playing softball or, you know, being out and about that sort of thing. And so I just didn't really have any veteran friends and I, I was missing kind of that brotherhood. And, mm-hmm. um, so but when I learned about Bunker Labs and then, you know, applying to get in and, and, um, it was a great experience. Of course, it was in person then, you know, we were, we were coming into WeWork every day or, or every other day or whatever, and we would meet once a week in person. Um, definitely has changed now. I mean, I think the organization has done a great job, like uh, getting it up to speed virtually. Um, but of course, here we are at, at WeWork and, you know, this is, you know, I, I appreciate like the, the collaboration and the connection mm-hmm. and, and being able to bounce ideas off of you. And, um, and I love the idea of helping uh, veterans of, of whether it's a veteran or a spouse of a veteran, um, you know, and, and kind of be that safe place. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we've, we've talked, you know, I've had some pretty honest conversations with people that I, I've known a week, you know, about their life and, and their experience in the military or as an entrepreneur or, a, or an aspiring entrepreneur. And so, um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so now you're a seed leader, you have mentor veterans now. And talk about this challenge. I say this all the time, like, you know, for those new like tech stars or YC Combinator is, it's like an incubator, accelerator, where you probably be in it. But it's pretty much the same thing. Like 10 companies go, they're tech startups, SaaS, they're all the same process. They got to you know, develop MVP, product market fit, find investors. So every time it's the same process. With us mm-hmm. at Bunko Labs, it's like, it's not the same, right? We've had like marijuana apps, nonprofits, um, construction companies. Hot sauce. Hot sauce, yeah. We've had like a... Um, you know, one guy who's like, man, I think I want to start a, a, a brewery, but I really, I'm not sure. So idea phase, another person came in, he had already raised like $8 million for uh, his company, like they did taxes for cryptocurrency companies, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So how have you done the channels, like trying to mentor all these companies, like from like, just bam, all over the place, right? How have you done, dealt with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of look at all the people as in the companies as like a, an opportunity for me to learn as well. And so I, I really want to take the personal approach, you know, I mean, I'm happy to share my experiences with them. I'm happy to um, answer questions if I can for them. Um, I don't, I don't know that it really matters what your business is and what it does. I think it's just more like, what are the challenges? Right. And I think that's what people kind of want to talk about. It's like, Hey, have you tried this before? Did it work for you? You know, it's kind of like the online forums. There's forums mm-hmm. for everything, obviously, but um yeah, to me, it's it's that personal connection and and just really kind of like being available. Uh, yeah, and, and teaching them stuff like something, something like when I, I, I turn on like the stuff I know, know like like three years ago, you told me Google Analytics. What the hell is Google Analytics, right? What's that? Or, no, just the same it's different tools that you try to teach people. You know, sure. Well, and and um, you know, like you and I talk a lot about pitching, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and and the only reason I have any pitching experience is from FI, mm-hmm. right? And you've pitched a lot. And so like challenging these, these, you know, entrepreneurs to, to put themselves to, out there, to stand up there and show us your baby, put yourself <laughs> right? out there and take those things yeah. and arrows from people. That's right. Yeah. And, and really give them that, that positive criticism or positive feedback and, and constructive criticism. Right. And to help them. I mean, and that's what it's all about. Right. It's like any, any time that I, we can help a veteran um, in need of anything, I think is, is a good thing. And, not to say there's not help for veterans. There's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of organizations out there, but in this entrepreneurial world, um, you know, maybe, you know, you do a great job of, of connecting and, and uh, uh, connecting people into your network, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody needs something. You're like, oh, I know somebody that can help you with that. And I, I think that's really cool, you know? And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. So entrepreneur, what, what are some kind of tools you use? Like part, read the productivity tool, time management tools? What do you rely on as far as tools? Yeah, so one of my favorites is is Live Plan, um, and it's a uh, business plan software. Um, you know, and it, it's it's amazing. Like at my first business, we didn't we really didn't have a business plan. You know, for years and years and years, and then it was like, you know, the painful. You know, this is like almost like rotary phone era. It feels like, um, you know, writing your business plan on paper, right? And it's like. Um, live plan it's by Palo Alto software is one of my favorites. I, I definitely recommend that for anybody that's, um, looking to start a business, you know, you have to have, you got to put some certain things on paper or on the computer. Um, love that. 
Um, it's funny, like I, I used to be totally opposed to all things Google for whatever reason. I just didn't know it, right? It's like, I mean, I barely learned Excel and now there's this new Google thing out there. And now I love Google, right? I love all things. Oh, yeah, Google. Oh, yeah, I love Google. Yeah. I mean, it, it's so much easier for me to use. And, and uh, so that's obvious. That's an obvious one. Um, what else? I think uh, Asana, right? From oh, yeah. Project, I love Asana. Project management. I think that's, a, Asana. that's a great place to, to you know, collaborate with your team. Um, you know, and I'll, but I'll say this too. Like, I'm a firm believer that, that, when we start working with software programs, whether it's like ACT, you know, as a CRM program mm -hmm. or Salesforce or something like that, we learn just enough to get the contact in there mm -hmm. and record our, our, you know, conversations. And it's like 1% of the software, right? And yeah. Like, 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 like even the iPhone, like no one uses iPhone for capability, right? Any, any, any tech, right? You know, yeah. probably use like 1%, you know? Yeah. But we all need the new iPhone 12. Of course. Yeah. We can't live without it. Yeah. Maybe even the iPhone 12 Pro yeah. Super. You like know, like me, yeah. The oversized beast. Um, you know, it's like a MacBook, right? I know enough. I can I can use it, mm -hmm. but I don't know all of the fancy, you know, shortcuts and no. you know, all the really cool ways to use it. But um, yeah, I, I think those are probably some of my favorites. Um, I've learned to use Canva. Yeah, I'm you know, now Canva I'm like too, this yeah. aspiring designer. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm just like trying to design cool stuff, and and uh, it, it's pretty funny though. My wife's like, give me a beaker. You know, it's just like, go sit down, okay? So talk about this. Like, both of us are not under 25, right? No. no. Talk about, you know, at our age, still being competitive, you know, still having focus and competing with, like, you know, quote, unquote, the still typical founder, right? Man, I mean, I'm I'm blown away at, like, some of the, the talent, right, that's out there. And it, it's like the young people these days are learning this stuff. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're literally being taught, right? And so what a huge advantage they have. I remember reading a few years back, there hadn't been more than a handful of, of people that had become billionaires mm -hmm. over the age of 40. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now, I mean, I had kids, my first children when I was 42, right? I had my first child. And so now I understand why mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like kids, like it, kid, it takes a lot of your time, right? I mean, yeah. it's amazing. Like there's nothing better in the world, but like, it, it's all about like how much time do you have to devote? Right. And these young kids collaborate, they learn this stuff. Um, What's the word intuitive? It's intuitive to them. Yeah, it is, right? It is. And it's, it's, um, they have so many friends around them that are doing great things. But I mean, I think for us, it's, um, I don't feel my age, you know? Yeah. I, like, I, I feel I so, act, I, I still focus, focus on energy right now. I don't act my age. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I ever will. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's about making sacrifices, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember there was a couple year period in my life where I was like, man, if I could just play this much golf for the rest of my life, I, I'm, I'm retired. And now I'm not, I don't play golf at all because mm -hmm. I'm just like full on, like yeah, it, I mean, full court press. I, you know, I, it was so nice. I went fishing and golfing and I actually enjoy those things, right? But like you fish and golf or do whatever and work your business, right? You can't, you know, there's a cost to everything, right? Right. Well, and it's pretty annoying to be on the golf course and working the whole time. And your friends are like, are you, are you actually going to talk to us at all? And you're like, oh, sorry, I'm just on my phone over here doing my thing. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm, I, I feel hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I'm, I'm still, uh, I still got time, you know? So do you see yourself every quote, every kind of quote, quote retiring? Are you going to like, you know, start business and work until like, what's the saying that you, until your 10 toes up? Uh, <laughs> Probably the latter. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm the same. I way, like yeah. working. I, I mean, and I, it's funny. I say that, I mean, I don't know that I, I like working, but I mm -hmm. like being creative. I mm -hmm. like working towards something and on something. Yeah. Um, in the same way. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know. And, and there's also that fear of, right. Like remember back in the day when people would retire at 55 or 60, and then they die at 58. Yeah. Two, yeah. You know, and it's like, I think if you keep your body and your mind active, um, I'm missing the biggest example, man. What's that guy's name? The investor from uh, Omaha, Nebraska, Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett, right? He, he like, and he, at least in his 80s, right? Goes to work 10 hours a day. I he's he vibrant. He might, might be. I mean, he's probably, you know, related to Dracula or something, you know? <laughs> exactly. But, you know, these people are like, you know, and like there's, um, on so, so I'm big on social media. I have a TikTok account. Now, we were on this, like, trash from TikTok. The guy following there, he's like, he's, he's at least 80 years old. He's a psychiatrist, right? 80 years old, a psychiatrist. He's on TikTok, right? Wow. Like, are you kidding me? Right? You're yeah. 80 years old on TikTok. Every day he does like like little dance, 
and gives advice in English and Spanish about psychiatrists. Or like, you know, take care of people, right? Good for him, yeah. So, yeah, you think you got to do stuff like that, you know? I think so. Yeah, I mean, uh, what else are you going to do? We can't wait to die, right? No. So we got some uh, comments on Facebook for you. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to butcher this name. Tiffany Riaz Berlera, put my money on me, boom. Okay. Cool. Uh, Michael Scott, good stuff, Mr. Neff. All right. And Tiffany again, 2060, what? I know some boom moves that will rock that tent. If that tent <laughs> is a rocking, don't come a knocking. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I love Tiffany. She's great. And then Matt, you know, talking about the, the, the Basil Hayden and some good stuff. Cool. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, the comments. That's awesome. I didn't I didn't realize that people were actually watching this. See, that's that's like how how tech savvy I am. Uh, but that's funny. If the net's rocking, don't come a knocking. <laughs> yep. Uh, Tiffany's our good friend from Houston. Uh, Michael Scott owns an amazing. Uh, uh, they call them slippers in Hawaii. Eighty mm-hmm. two year old business. Um, I remember you talking about yeah, that his business. Grandfather started it, and they're based in in Hawaii. They're amazing. It's. Uh, if anybody's looking for uh, sandals slash slippers, and I'm not supposed to say this, but flip flops, scotthawaii.com. That's who. That's the. That's who I've talked to. That's great. So here's a question I ask, I ask everyone on here that comes on. You know, an entrepreneur everyone says, you know, keep grinding, keep going, don't give up. You know, um, don't be the person who has like you know um, mining diamonds. You stop before you hit the diamonds. You know, keep it going. But is there a time when someone should stop? I don't, I'm not talking about just not pivot, but like just stop, like, you know, like when should someone stop or someone keep on going regardless? Oof, tough question. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's a financial, a family and a fire, right? Mm-hmm. The three F's, right? Like if you don't, if the money's not there, it's kind of tough to keep mm-hmm. going. Um, there's always ways, of course, mm-hmm. but um, if your family's, you know, in, in, a bad position because of, of your mm-hmm. entrepreneurial dream, then, you know, family first. Uh, and, and I think probably fire, you know, being last, it's like, if you don't have the drive and, and, you know, the tenacity to get up and, and go after it, um, you know, is, is it, is it you or is it the product or the brand? Right. And so, um, I, I would say don't ever give up really, you know, I mean, sometimes you can, you can park it, um, you know, you can reinvent it, you can pivot, you can do a lot of different things to, um, you know, to turn it around, but I ask for help, you know, get it, get, 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 in, get into a, a, get into the ecosystem, you know, and even if it's online, right, there's so much out there, obviously there's, you know, if you're a veteran or, or a veteran family member, there's bunker labs, there's like endless resources. Um, if you're, if you're not, there's still endless resources. And I think, don't be afraid to to ask for help. That's a good point. Like people want to help you, right? But you have to ask, you know. Right. Like I'm pretty sure, like in my experience, like 90% of the people I ask for help, they they said yes. Other 10 and then nine percent say, Well, I can't help you now, follow up with me. And one percent, like of course. There's always been like you know, the the X percent would be asshole jackasses, right? Sure. You just gotta like, know dust them off and you know, maybe you had a bad day that day or they're busy, you know. So you yep. said you can't take it personal, like you said. Yep. I mean, I I I think that if you're if you're an entrepreneur and you're talking to another entrepreneur i mean it's almost like the unwritten creed right Mm -hmm. like you have to give back Mm -hmm. you need to like you need to be there at least to to listen Mm -hmm. right and um that being said i think there's those there's plenty of entrepreneurs that ask for help you make an appointment with them they blow you off you give them any kind of advice they tell you you're wrong and I, I think those are the people that I would like, I would give limited mm-hmm. bandwidth to that, yeah. that don't even want to like hear that feedback. I mean, you ask me for feedback mm-hmm. and then you tell me I'm wrong. I'm like, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. So you're doing the Kickstarter um, kickoff May 13th. Are you doing like any kind of big social media push? Any like how, how like, May trial, how are you going to prep for May 13th? How is that going to work? Yeah, sure. Collecting emails, um, social media. Uh, now that we've got the video, we'll break that down into, into a little 10 and 15 mm-hmm. second uh, snippets, mm-hmm. right? And so just start promoting that. Um, hopefully people like it. They want to mm-hmm. share it. We'll start giving free stuff away. Um, stickers, hats, shirts, uh, the, the reusable bags I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to entice people to tell their friends and... and um, and sign up and give us feedback. I mean, that's really, that's really kind of like the, the big way, obviously spending money, yeah. uh, lots of paid ads. You gotta make, 
spend money, make money. Yeah, I mean, we've been. But Facebook ads are relatively still kind of cheap. You know, they're not that expensive. Sure, sure. I mean, we've been fairly conservative in, mm-hmm. with that. I mean, we think we've got a pretty good base. Um, we won't stop though. I mean, yeah. obviously, we're going to keep spending. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to the video. Mm-hmm. Like, how good it, how good does it look? Yeah, are, are you, I, I, I think the stat, I make this up. The stats show, like you know. If you have a video, you're gonna raise like fifty seven percent more money than non video, right? Sure. From the video, I mean if you if you do if you're out there you think about doing a crowdfunding Kickstarter, you have to do a high quality video. You have yeah. to pay I mean, hopefully you have someone who can like do it for free for you because I like, like actually video or for a photographer or the case be. But if not, you have to invest some money. You have to pay the money yeah. for, for a video. Mine wasn't free. Even though even though my, lucky. Even though my friend did it, it wasn't free. Yeah, mine, mine was free. At least mine was for free for right now. I'm yeah. paying later on. But yeah, you, I mean, if you do a Kickstarter, you have to do a video. I mean, high quality. It can't mean like. For sure. You can't do it on iPhone, right? No. You got to do high quality video. Yeah. And take after take after take. Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you this too. I mean, for all the, the photogs and videographers out there, I, I never really realized how much work it is it's a lot of work. until I went and I was like, I was basically the production assistant on this photo shoot. And like my buddy, uh, his favorite word is do it again. Yeah. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. And yeah. I mean, I got sunburnt super uh, yeah, sunburnt. I do my view of these 20, 20 takes, right? Yeah. Okay. You're talking and you're like, you flubber your words, blah, 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 like shit. I got to yeah. do it again. You know, or everything's perfect. And like, that's something that happens. Right. Yeah. We were doing the voiceover. I mean, I, I've never really thought like, my voice would be a, vo- a voiceover voice. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, man, you have a great voice. It's yeah, all yeah. good. Let's do it. And I remember like on take 25, cracking up, like just losing my shit. I did a couple times just, too, yeah. like cracking up. Yeah, you're just laughing. Like, and, why, why am I laughing And for? he was laughing at me because he's like, you've never, you know, because I've never done this before. And he's like, dude, this is, this is normal. You're like, you're losing it. Let's go outside for a minute, right? And so yeah, we, let's we take a break. Outside and yeah. Fortunately, we're in Mexico, so we went to the beach. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was a great experience. I I a lot of respect and uh I learned a lot. So so talk so that's a good follow-up point. As entrepreneur talk about the importance of like putting yourself out there, right? Like being comfortable with being in front of a crowd. Like like we'll say like 30, 40 years ago, no one really knew who the CEO of like IBM was or CEO of whatever mm-hmm. the company was, and name the company, right? Mm-hmm. Now I'm not saying like you have to be everyone has to be like Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, or like Elon Musk. But the days of like being the unknown CEO are long gone, right? Right. I mean whatever size company you have startup, you know, small business, you have to get out in social media and say, I'm Jason Kavanagh. This is my company, right? Yep. Talk about how you deal with that. or your approach to that? I mean, I just, I follow you. <laughs> you're, like, you're amazing. Uh, you, you definitely get it done. Uh, you know, I think it kind of goes back to the pitching, right? Mm-hmm. Learning to pitch. I mean, I, I, I don't have a tremendous amount of public speaking experience. And so, you know, getting up in front of a room of people and just like, you know, freaking out basically. And, and, being told by the mentors, like quit freaking out. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, um, but you have to put yourself out there. I mean, you really do like, uh, you know, it's kind of shameless Mm self-promotion. Um, but you know, if, if not me, then who exactly, you know, and, and you said it earlier when we were talking, um, you have to, you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and, and that's, uh, you just do it. Right. Yeah. And and with pitching, here's a good point. Like a, like a business advice for everyone. Like, to me, pitching is like doing a resume, right? Like if you send a resume to 25 people, you get 25 different opinions. Mm-hmm. If you pitch in front of 25 different people, you get 20 different opinions, right? Some good, some bad. For example, like, um, so I was in a Patriot boot camp. I'm part of Patriot boot camp. It's like a, a organization for, for veteran, veteran entrepreneurs. Somehow, I don't know how, but I, I got picked as like one of the top eight companies there. So I went to the thing called Patriot boot camp. Elite eight. Sponsored by Google for startups, final track, like big deal, pitching, right? We had to do this, do this big pitch, like three minute pitch. Everyone loved it, right? Everyone praised me, man. That's a, that's a great pitch. I mean, it wasn't for my nothing. It's like experience, like like the exposure to VCs. Great pitch, whatever, man. This is great, right? A month later, I was on t- I'm on a TV show. It's called David Mitchell's Two Minute Pitch. So David Mitchell, one of my business, uh, my board advisors, has a new show called Two Minute Pitch. It's gonna show in June, but we recorded last month, right? And it's it's two minutes, three minutes. I did exact, pretty much the same exact pitch, same energy, same. I even like. I record, I, I look at both, like, man, these are about the same, but Pedro Bootcamp, praise, praise, praise. The um, David Mitchell, I got fucking slammed. I mean, they didn't say that, but they pretty much said this is the fucking worst pitch I've ever seen in my fucking life, right? <laughs> I, mean, I got fucking slammed, right? <laughs> so there's four people, um, two of them like blasted me, right? This is hard. They didn't say this hard, but they pretty much like, you didn't bring the engine, nothing like that. 
one person like, you know, this was, I, I got your idea. I know what you're doing. I'm good with that. Of course, David was kind of, you know, kind of neutral, right? Right. But I got fucking blasted, right? So it was like, you know, who, who, or like, same pitch, like, am I great or am I fucking fucked up, right? Right. So I think you got to keep that in mind when you're doing the, doing these pictures or whatever the case may be. And of course, nice TV, they probably do for drama stuff right there. But even though I got a slam, it's going to be on Bloomberg TV, Amazon Prime Video, and who knows who's going to say it, right? Oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, who's going to say it, right? Right. I mean, just because these two people said it was horrible or like not enough energy, you know, someone has to be pitching for you. Someone might see it and like, oh, man, this is a great idea. Here's like $100,000, right? I've seen bad reviews for the movie Top Gun, okay? Those so, people so need to go they, to the, now they, they, That person needs to go to hell. They, they need to go to hell. <laughs> they go to hell. hell. And, and, and I mean, I think that's like my point though is, you know, it's, it's, there's so many different points of view. Yeah. You know, some, somebody might be judging you on, you know, your, your awesome beard mm -hmm. versus and that somebody person, judging you on like the, the character of your idea, yeah. right? like the, the foundation of it. And that person could be like this TV, I want to make myself look good, you know? Right. Or my own company, right? You just know, but you gotta, you know, and another thing too, like people always say, like, don't, don't take it personal. I call bullshit on that, right? Right. Yeah, this is my, this is your baby, your company. How can you not take it personal, right? Yeah. You just told me my idea sucks. Yeah. But I won't take it personal. I won't take it personal. Yeah. Yeah. You. I, I mean, you know, it's funny. I like. I think for me, my personality is is remembering that, um, I don't necessarily have to be aggressive back toward that person. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never been like that great person in the corner. You mm -hmm. know, like I don't get, I don't like getting put in the corner, and so, um. Just remembering that it is what it is, yeah. and you know you don't get to come out swinging. Yeah. You just have to take it and say thank you. And yeah, thank you. May have another. Yeah. Thank you for your feedback and your advice. Yeah, and find someone else that that's you know pitch worthy. I think is is important. But the point is, you got to put yourself out there, even if you get negative criticism. Put yourself out there, and you know you got to me. You got to be a social media, right? You got to you know whatever the case may be. Like, I'm not saying like be Gary Vaynerchuk, he's like a different level, but like right. you, you got your piece out out there, right? You got to, you know, yeah. be open to criticism and open to new ideas. Yeah. Well, that's a warning to my following, my friends. <laughs> I'm going to start putting myself out there a little bit more. So get ready. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm, I, you know, I, it's funny. Like I've always kind of walked that fine line. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I almost want everything to speak for itself, mm -hmm. but you're right. I mean, you do, you have to, yeah. you have to put yourself out there and you have to, uh, you have to work hard and you have to be a little shameless um, and you have to be ready for what comes back at you, you know, because it's not, it's, it's to your point. It's not always unicorns, unicorns, and, unicorns and roses, unicorns, roses, <laughs> rainbows. Yeah. Exactly. You gotta be able to deal with criticism too. And like, you know, and like that Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, he always say, you know, more content, more content, you know, are you on the 10 times? Be on the 11 times. Right. Mm -hmm. And then like some people say like, you're on there too much, but like, like, like Gary Vaynerchuk says, I'm a big believer. Right. If you put something like something on LinkedIn only on LinkedIn once a day, who's gonna see it? Right. No one. Right. There's so much stuff on LinkedIn. Yeah. I mean, even like one, if you put something once a day on even for social media platform, no one's gonna see it. You gotta over and date it, right? And if yeah. and if someone says, like, man, Jason, you on you on here too much, you know, okay, well, you know, unfollow me, you know, like right. Yeah, I mean, I actually took a class for uh for LinkedIn because I was I was on and I still haven't really like mastered this. I'm not very active on LinkedIn. Um yeah, but it was basically I've, the art of like posting on LinkedIn. Yeah. I, I was just like, well, what do I even say? What is, does anybody care what I have to say? Yeah, I have a love hate relationship with LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. If I owned a bunch of LinkedIn stock, I'd love it more. Okay. Probably so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. LinkedIn, I don't know. Because LinkedIn, it's a, before you'd be able to like, used to be able to like send all kinds of invites on LinkedIn, right? Unlimited. Now you can only send like 100 invites per week on LinkedIn, different people, right? Of course, it's a spam, you know, I understand that, right? But it has to be a better way to protect people from spam, you know? Yeah. And I think spam means different things to different people, right? Like when I was doing my crowdfunder, I was sending like individuals like sales never get messages. This person said, well, I didn't give you permission to send this to me. I'll just spam like, dude, I sent you one message. Yeah. Like we never communicated before in our life. I see one message. How is this spam, right? Right. I, I don't know. But then like you point to like you, somebody sees a connection, you're like, man, I don't know. I really don't know this person. I'll connect anyway. And then instantly a 10,000 word, double single space, all caps message, you know, and you and you know, of course you're not gonna read it because you, you you know I'm not interested in or like the biggest one like you know I just see it all the time I I can do your software development for this come on sure. hey thanks for offering we have an internal team I'm I know you have an internal team but I'm, but I'm sure all, all people are better right like are you kidding me right now I to me I mean I I 
being like kind of an old school salesperson, I, I just, I don't get the idea that you can sell on LinkedIn. Yeah. A lot of people do it though. And and then I'm, and I'm probably wrong. Yeah. A lot of people do it. I'm sure, you know, it's kind of like SMS messaging, Mm -hmm. right? Like that to me is kind of strange. But then when you look at the the engagement and the conversion numbers there yeah, versus, SMS is a hot versus right email, now. it's so much better. But like again, there's there's these different sort of levels of of uh, demographic, right? Like I mean, it's it's an age thing, you know. And I think you just have to get comfortable, you know. If if SMS marketing works, we should all be SMS marketing. So speaking of that, have you heard of this company called uh, I think it's called Community? They're like a text based messaging app. I haven't. No. They just raised two billion dollars from the Salesforce Venture Capital Fund. Wow, two billion. Two billion That's for text-based wow. messaging. Wow. All right. Well, I guess I'm gonna start SMS marketing. <laughs> That's fucking crazy, ain't it? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, it is. So the last we have is Knob Creek. Okay, a classic. Yeah. Yep. And after this, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to judge these. Okay. Well, I mean, I know I, I know which one's winning right now. I mean, unless this is like Knob Creek. Platinum Plus. Platinum Plus, exactly. Okay, it's a good basic bourbon. Remember back in the day when uh, we thought the best bourbon, well, me, I can't speak for you, you just think the best bourbon was Jack Daniels? No, but I do like the, that Eric Church song, mm-hmm. Jack Daniels kicked my ass last night. I like that song, but I've, I've never been a fan. Like, no. Anything that, the, anything brown that you mix brown with. That's like, true. Yeah, not, not my speed. So here's a crazy story. So I used to do a lot of deep sea, deep sea fishing out of Westport, uh, Washington. One time me and my son, a couple of friends went, and in and, and Westport, the boat leaves at 6 in the morning, but you had to be there 5 in the morning, right? So we leave from DuPont 3, get there 5. So boat leaves at 6. These two guys on there, they're at least in the 60s. Well, I, I'll be generous in the 60s, right? You can, you can tell they spent, like, their life on the boat, right? They had this, this they had a cooler as about probably as big as this table. So it's 6 in the morning. About, it takes, like, two hours to get to where we're fishing, right? right? But, so 6 to 8. But 7, by hour out, 7 in the morning, the one guy says, hey, do you think we waited waited long enough to start? Because up to me, you would have started, you know, on the drive up here. <laughs> and so they pull out, I swear to God, a bottle twice the size of wild turkey and a case of Schaefer Light. Oh, nice. That shit was gone in an hour. And they were not phased. Then what? They caught all the fish. <laughs> like they caught 90% of the fish. <laughs> and, you know, divided to us. Like they caught all the fish, right? Yeah, right. And that's that's the mouth of wild turkey at seven in the morning. I'll never I'll never forget that. And that shape of light, brutal. <laughs> oh my god, that's like drinking natty light. <sighs> yeah, that's bad. That's but bad. It was like, I think it's bad for you. They took it like champs. Seasoned veterans, exactly. Seasoned yeah. veterans. <laughs> nice. So, is there anything I should ask you that I didn't? Uh, what's next? What is next? What's next? Well, we uh, we are about to embark on an amazing adventure. Um, my mom always used to say I had itchy feet, and uh, not because they were dirty or really, in fact, itchy, but because like I couldn't stay put very long. Uh, and so we actually put our house on the market last Wednesday. Uh, it went under contract yesterday, and June eighteenth, we are moving to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Oh wow! Yeah. So why that place? Well, so my wife uh, grew up in Guadalajara. Okay, I uh, was born in Guadalajara, and uh, so kind of go back, going back home for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and her folks are in Puerto Vallarta, and so I think if if COVID's taught us anything, it's that um, you know we no longer we don't have to be in Seattle or uh, you know New York mm-hmm. or, or really you can work from anywhere in the world, especially mm-hmm. doing what we do. Um, and so I love Seattle. You know, I, I grew up here. However, comma. The, however, comma. The weather didn't bother me growing up. And now I'm like, I don't know. It's uh, it's when it's when it's sunny here. It's I don't know if there's any place. That's yeah. When it's beautiful, beautiful like, like, when it, for me, okay. only place more beautiful here than uh, is uh, Salzburg, Austria. Wow. Salzburg, Austria is like is like so nice there. Right. Yeah. So the, when this place is nice, it is beyond nice. Oh, it shines. It's amazing. Um, But I'm like you like this last year. That shit kicked my ass. I'm looking for some some warm weather. Um, my in-laws are there and, you know, the kids get to spend time with their grandparents, yeah, you exactly. know, and they get to experience the culture. Um, you know, the schools are, are bilingual, trilingual. So they're going to get, you know, really a cool experience to live abroad. Um, any and, concerns and about while they're young, you know, it's, any concern it's, about having your kids, raising your kids in a different country? No, not at all. 
Uh, in fact, I think it's it's going to just be really a, an incredible experience for them. Um, now, do your kids already speak Spanish? Not so much, a little, okay, a little. Um, but they're really excited about it. I mean, you know, I mean, they're four and six years old. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, COVID detached them from the few friends that yeah. they were able to make in the short amount. Yeah, of time I, I, I think here. people underestimate or over, overestimate the impact this had on kids, like not going to school, not being friends, like. Sure. Can you imagine, like, if growing up, if someone said, like, you just text race, someone said, do you miss school? No, I don't miss school. But now kids are saying, I miss school. Yeah. I mean, and, and you never imagine people saying, I miss school. Yeah. But, I mean, we miss school for them. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. yeah. You know, they're sick of us. We're like, man, we'd really love for you to be back in school. And and, and certainly these formidable young years, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they learn so quickly. I mean, it's yeah. amazing to watch them grow. I'm just sponges. And learn. And so I think, you know, they'll pick up Spanish, no problem. Um, yeah. So we're excited. I mean, that's, that's, uh, you know, you can, as long as you have Wi-Fi, as long as we have Wi-Fi, mm-hmm. we can, we can do what we need to do in an airport nearby. And that's, we've got those things. We've got the beach. Um, Always a plus. We're excited. Yeah. And, a, and a real beach, not the coast, not the Pacific coast, right? A real beach. Proper beach. Yeah. Big, beautiful beach. And so we, we have a, a real affinity for it. You know, we got married in, in Sailita, which is just north of Puerto Vallarta. Um, and so, yeah. We're, we're fired up. That's, that's, that's what's next, I think, personally. And then, of course, professionally, we'll bring it with us. Like you said, uh, most entrepreneurial companies, you can run it from anywhere, right? Right. Absolutely. I mean, I think half the the young hotshots that are that are running tech companies around the world are doing, a, doing Bali, Bali or, you know, Thailand or exactly some crazy place, yeah. you know, or, or the middle of nowhere, you know. Yeah. I'm just trying to be like them. So talk about this, you know, uh, let's go back to work and remote work. So, you know, back before pre-COVID, everyone was like, you know, let's do remote work, you know. And people are like, we're doing remote, remote work now. But to me, this is not what remote work is, right? Now people are like, you know, like, you know, teaching kids, you know, babysitting, taking, you know, their parents or whatever. To me, remote work was like, wake up in the morning, having breakfast, going to the gym, and come back to office space, like just only you working. But we're doing so much other stuff, right? Yeah. Can you talk about that some, how that is affecting people? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, how it affects other people, I'm not really sure. I mean, you're right. I, I mean, the old days of remote work were maybe you were lucky to work from home. Uh, potentially, you went to a co-working space. Um, I mean, honestly, when we lost WeWork, I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, I'm at home. My wife's at home. Yeah, I was at your house one time. I was like, you, you're you working. Your wife's working. It was like, She's up. I was in the closet working. Your wife had a meeting. And then there was like a teacher conference and the other son's like, Hey, how about me? You know, it's like yeah. all this chaos, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think that was the the biggest challenge for us and probably for most parents are, that are out there. I mean, it's, you know, you want your kids to have like a balanced life. You know, we're not, we're not a big TV, um, tech, like iPad mm-hmm. video game family. And so, you know, it was, it was really like fighting that urge. You know, if you give a kid an iPad, that's a babysitter. Yeah. Right? But we just, we really didn't, we don't like the effect that it has on them. Mm-hmm. And so we always kind of fought that, but then that means, you know, we have to give more, mm-hmm. right. And it means we can't work as much because we want to, you know, we need to keep them entertained and keep them busy. Um, I think that was our biggest challenge. You know, I was telling my wife, I'm like, so we have a fire pit in our backyard. And uh, I was like, I think this, this fire pit saved me, <laughs> you know, like I burned more wood <laughs> during COVID, like, snow on the ground in the mm-hmm. winter, I'd go out there and like have a fire and, and the kids would come out and we'd do s'mores, you know, and I think that was, um, it was a, a really good kind of release for me. Um, and my wife's like, Hey, it's too, I'm like, it's cold. I'm not, I'll come yeah. out for a s'more yeah. and I'm going back in. Yeah. And for me, it would just be like, kind of, matter of fact, make the spore and bring it inside of me. <laughs> exactly. Breathing the fresh air and just, it was kind of an outlet, you know? And, and so I'm, that's how I dealt with it really, you know? So, and, and, and our kids too, I mean, so as an entrepreneur, what's something you had, you've had you had to give up, right? It's something like you would like to do, but you, you know, man, I wish I could do this. I, just, I, can't, I can't justify spending time on it that you wish you could do. Like pose, I mean, I got one, but I shouldn't talk about it. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, uh, well, probably, you know, the news outlets, mm-hmm. right? I mean, like the world's pretty toxic right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't care which way you lean and there's a lot of bad information and negative information out there. And so I think kind of staying away from that as Mm -hmm. much as I can does me good. Um, You know, I kind of leaned into the thing is it was maybe less about giving up and more Mm -hmm. about leaning into the things that, that like do me good. Right. Mm -hmm. I love to juice, Mm -hmm. you know, like juicing fresh fruit and things like that. So I love that. That makes me 
because we puts me in a good place. Mm-hmm. Um, I started uh, looking at the Headspace app every day, mm-hmm. you know, and trying to find a little bit of like it's like a meditation app. It is, yeah. And and I always thought like, man, wouldn't it be cool if I could meditate? And I, I my brain is just like, just doesn't never work. never shuts off, right? But the Headspace, it, it's kind of a short little little sprint, and mm-hmm. it, that's a nice getaway. I think going to the gym, yeah. Um, and then just like, you know, if there was a a silver lining for COVID. I mean, it would be like for all the parents that, that have embraced the fact that they're with their children, like just leaning in on it, you know, like I really know my four and six year old little boys really well, you know, and uh, and then, of course, we weren't going to I had a dog for a long time and then we adopt we adopted a dog during COVID, mm-hmm. which everybody in the world did. And, you know, we have a love hate relationship, me and him. He thinks I'm his mom and dad. Yeah, your dog is definitely unique. Yeah, he's your a, dog has a unique personality. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, he's a wild. You, dog. Your dog think is human. Yeah, yeah, but um, I don't know. I think it was kind of leaning in on those things as opposed to like weaning off the things. You know. So, talk about the points of taking yourself as an entrepreneur. The points of what? The, te- the points of taking care of yourself as an entrepreneur, like going to the gym, doing meditation. Like, I mean, yeah, I it, mean. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. But, but I mean, the time is already limited. And you have to find time to do it. But some of the entrepreneurs like grind, grind, grind. And next thing you know, they're five, seven, three hundred pounds, or like you know, this like they're broken mentally, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you, no matter what, I mean, you have to find that balance. Um, you have to, you have to take care of yourself, right? I mean, and and uh, um, for me, it's the gym. Um, you know, spending time with the family, uh, eating right, and yeah, I mean, I, COVID or no COVID, I mean, you know, we have to take care of ourselves. And so I think it's it's kind of those core things for me, really. So COVID, of course, is a bad thing. You know, a lot of people died. A lot of business went out of business, of course, you know. How has COVID affected your three business, right? Positive, negative, you just, you just dealt with it, you overcame it. How has that worked for you? Yeah, really. I mean, only one business has been running during COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, we've grown. You know, I mean, I, I think we've, we're in the online space to, to a big degree and social media as well. And so um, we've been really fortunate in that, in that regard. Um, you know, I, I have friends that own restaurants and we just feel terribly for them. Right. It's like, basically they were, they were it's ordered to close the doors and, them. and uh, you know, good luck. And, um, and with the restaurants off as a subject, like, I mean, they were treated so unfairly, right? Like, of course, California is a different thing they're doing there. Mm-hmm. I remember they had a story like a couple of weeks ago where there's a lady, she had a restaurant like 20, 30 years, right? And basically she finally got a business, right? Because no, no, no restaurants, 10%, whatever case would be. The day she shut down, because she couldn't be open, across the street, this movie theater in Hollywood had this big gala. Oh, right. Food, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me right now, right? Like, uh, how? Yeah, that's tough. That? I that, mean, that, that's bullshit. I, <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty high level of it, I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is there. I mean, I try not to wade too deep into the into the pool. Um, I think there's a lot of weirdness surrounding this whole thing. I, you know, I just, um, you know, I've been to China so many times. I feel like I've got everything that that could be thrown at me. You know, I I got chicken pox in my forties. I, I mean, I mean, you survived. Fever. You survived China. I, I had typhoid fever. Uh, I've, you know you know, been in Mexico and been pretty sick. I mean, and I don't know, I, I don't, I don't want COVID by any means. I'm not, I don't, I don't know what it's like, obviously. Um, I don't know if I've had it or haven't had it. Um, I hope it goes away. I hope we all get to go back to, you know, not wearing masks and, and uh, yeah, th- this going, were, to, going to festivals and concerts and things like that. This is where my negative TV comes out, right? Like, I just think as society, you know, how we, we accept that, you know, each year, X percent die from cancer, X amount die from flu, X amount die from car accidents. I just think as a society, we're going to have to accept that X amount of us are going to die from COVID every year, right? Yeah. Because COVID is not going away. Yeah. And it was like what, eight strains now, six strains, you I know? Mean, it's a virus, right? Viruses don't go I don't away. think viruses go away, right? I think it's probably here to stay, but um, I don't know. I, I, I wish everybody well that, everybody well, just in general, right? I mean, those people that have gotten and passed away, it's super sad and and um, I don't know. I, I hope uh, hope they figure it out soon. Yeah, I'm hopefully people way smarter than us are figuring this stuff out, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, 
next next question I have for you. We gotta wrap this up pretty soon. Moving to Mexico, how so it doesn't affect your business any that much. How is it gonna be like does Mexico China have a good relationship? How's that gonna affect the China thing? Yeah, no, I mean, I'll still bring, I mean, I'll, I'll basically, we live there. Um, you still come to the States to do business and we stuff? We operate or? from there. I mean, in terms of like inventory for mm-hmm. Compo, it'll it'll live in America. Okay. For sure. Just because Mexico is like the infrastructure for uh, that kind of shipping. It's just not really there yet. Is there any advantage for like, are you going to move your headquarters like on paper from Seattle to Mexico? Is there any no. advantage of that? No, we'll leave it. Uh, Compo is actually a Texas company because we were in Good Houston. move, good yeah, move, we were in good Houston. move, Houston. good move. Yeah. We were in Houston for a while, and so okay. we, we started the company there. Uh, and so we'll keep it there. Um, Traction Bridge and Skew Candy are Washington companies, and, and we'll leave them here. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, Skew Candy is a Delaware corporation. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, no, nothing about that will change. Okay. Um, you know, we maintain all of our banking here in the States mm-hmm. and, and um, you know, set up a business address and all that sort of stuff. So obviously, you know, your wife, your wife's from Mexico. You've been in Mexico several times before. I think you just came for vacation there. Yep. Um, how how me ask this? So, is it advanced to doing being in Mexico doing business? Other than the the beautiful beach yeah. and sunshine yeah. and all that, no. I mean, I I don't know that there's an advantage. Okay. I mean, I think, um, like. If you're employed by a an American company mm-hmm. and you live in you live abroad, mm-hmm. you get X number of dollars tax free. Okay. Um, so that's potentially one thing. But you know, you I mean, even if you buy a property down there mm-hmm. and you you rent it out, you still have to pay taxes to good old Uncle Sam for sure. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, there's two countries in the world: the the U.S. and the U.K. <laughs> what? And so yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh. yeah, yeah. No matter no matter where you go, unless you give up your citizenship, which of course I'm not going to. Um, oh my goodness yeah <laughs> what yeah 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 Talk so if you someone. own an airbnb in mexico you still have to pay taxes on that earned income in america i'm like speechless right now that's true that's true it's a good thing you know that yeah well i mean we don't have any investment properties there but uh if we did we understand the the tax implications for sure man so john i understand you have something for our listeners yeah, I, I wanted to uh, give a uh, 20% off uh, discount code to uh, the Cabinets HR following. Um, and with the understanding that we don't have any product yet, uh, but we will soon. Um, and so once we're off of the Kickstarter platform and we're, we're on our direct-to-consumer site, it'll be a 20% off coupon code. Uh, and I think we're going to go with uh, Cabinets HR, and that'll get you 20% off. So quick question. So the Kickstarter... What do you have to pay them? Five percent. And is that five percent even if you don't meet your goal? Uh, only if you meet your goal. So if you don't meet your goal, you don't pay anything. As far as I know. So are you are you doing like the like? So there's different things. I I know Indiegogo. There's like I, I have the term right. There's limited, limited. Like if you there's one thing you like if you pick like um like a reserve price. Reserve price, yeah. Yeah. No, Kickstarter's all in. All in. So yeah. either you everything either, or nothing. You either make it, yeah. All yeah, or nothing. yeah. Kickstarter, you can pick where like you know like. It's all in at twenty five thousand dollars. So you have to raise twenty five thousand dollars, or you can buy, pick like the alternative, and you even you raise fifteen thousand, fifteen thousand dollars to get the money. But like for me, if I raise twenty five thousand dollars, I owe them five percent. But if I only raise like ten thousand, I owe them nine percent. Oh, okay. But with you, it's, it's, so it's just, tiered. Yeah, tiered. Yeah, tiered. Yeah. Yeah. So with you, it's all in. It's all in. Yeah, and so that's why I mean, you know, everybody, it, people that I've spoken to, and and other people that have done campaigns, of course, um, like that's why you need to choose wisely. Yeah. You know, but for me, like, I mean, I don't want to say like I'm overly confident. Like, I, I think we're going to hit our goal, mm-hmm. but it's still it's it, it makes a lot of sense to set a, a an achievable goal. Mm-hmm. Um, once you achieve that goal, Kickstarter starts to give you like love through the algorithm. Yeah. And so, you know, you're funded. Yeah, they know they're going to get their money. You're going to get your yeah. money. Yeah. Which, they, which, they, you know, they, it's not money. It's money to use to buy product. Yeah. Right. Can they tell you like, you know, like suppose there's two companies. One company says my goal is twenty five thousand. Other company says, you know, my goal is one hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. If you hit the company twenty five thousand dollars, you hit fifty thousand, you get all this love, right? Because you're like twenty percent right. over, blah blah blah. You you know, the algorithm kicks in. You you know, one of the right. top companies. Other company they raise sixty five thousand. That's more than fifty thousand, but it's only like two third, one third or two thirds of a hundred thousand are sure. They get no love, right? 
And so you gotta keep that mindset. That's why we say that kind of keep it like low, so to speak, you know. Right. Right. So all these people listening will take that love <laughs> on the first day and the second day. So here's here's some advice I can give to you on my crowdfunding, right? One yeah. thing I've learned, like I was saying, like like one thing I learned, like when I said like I was sending direct message emails, no one responded. Once I start, like I'll take Instagram for example. At first, I send like like text messages of Instagram, like DMs, you know, blah blah blah. Once I start sending voice messages, mm. like when I was sending a text, a text message on, on like a DM on Instagram or whatever mess, whatever platform, hey, you know, blah blah blah, I'm doing crowdfunding, blah blah blah, you know, please donate, support, blah. blah. Well, they don't want to no right? A few did, not really. But once I started sending voice messages, it was a whole different ball game. Wow. So, I mean, I would definitely like... You mean through the Instagram platform? Or the Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook. Gotcha. Once I started sending the the voicemails, okay. that it, it kicked off. Good to know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so I would, not even waste, I would not even waste time to new texts. I would yeah. just send voices. Right, right. I mean, I think there's a little more personal touch, right? Yeah. I mean, hey, it's Jason. I mean, either way, shot, either right? way, it fucking sucks, you know. Right. <laughs> I mean, please buy my product. I mean, imagine sending like right now on Instagram, send like a thousand messages, basically like, hey, hey, John F, how you doing? Hope you have a great day. You know, just a reminder, you know, this is Jason from Kevin's HR. Uh, we still do the crowdfunding. So April twentieth, it really be great if you could support by donating or sharing with the networks. Hey, thanks for your time. Remember, you're great day every day. Right. Over and over and over and over again. You can't do a, a group text or a group voice message? They never always say it's fucking spam. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean. What's the thing? You got to do the things that don't scale. Uh-huh. Yeah. On Facebook, we have like 2,500 followers. On Instagram, we're, we're basically new. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were able to merge a couple of accounts mm -hmm. on Facebook. But Instagram, pretty small. So I'd only have to do like 120 people. Yeah. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> So can you share your social media links for yourself and your company? Yeah. So on, uh, on Facebook, we're Compo Designs. Um, on Instagram, we're at Compo Designs. Um, my name is John Neff, and uh, I'm on LinkedIn, of course. Uh, it's, on, it's under Jonathan, my, uh, my official name. Um, YouTube, I believe you're sharing the link. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. on yours. Um, and uh, we're brand new on YouTube as well. So we've got more video content coming from... Uh, the one and only Jeff Brockmeyer, my my buddy, the videographer. Uh, so yeah, more more coming. So that's a good point. Like you have a videographer now. Talk about the points. Like like we talked talk about it back in the day, CEOs and not like uh, out there in public. But now you pretty much every company is pretty much a media company, right? You yeah. Got, you got you got to have a media company, right? How sure. you how you doing that with your with your friend? Yeah, I mean, um, you, and you're right. I mean, if you're a startup, you're you're a hustling company. Um, I mean, if, if not me, who? Right. I mean, yeah. I'm like, boom, I don't, we don't make any money at Compo. So where do I get money to, you know, send people out to do things? It's like, you got to get out there and do it yourself. Um, but my videographer is phenomenal. I mean, he's done like a bunch of work for huge brands, mm -hmm. Nike, Adidas. Um, and he's, you know, you, you find good partners that you can, mm -hmm. can kind of take you along on the path. I mean, it's like, I'm not a videographer, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not a script writer. I'm not a, a, a director of any kind. And so I think finding those really key partners and, and trusting their, their, their vision, mm -hmm. like along with your vision and then like, um, you know, collaborating together. And, and, and that's an important thing too, right? It's like, and we haven't talked about this, but I think it's, it's huge. Like we're entrepreneurs, we're founders and like, how big's our ego, right? Yeah. And, and how much great you, point, great how, point. How much are you going to let your ego get in the way of your success, right? Mm -hmm. Like if I think, you know, I tell the videographer who's done five hundred shoots that I want it done this way, and this and da da da, and he's giving me advice and I'm not taking it. I mean, he's, you, did, you he, deserve to fail. He's looking at me like you're such a fool, man. Yeah, like, you, I'm you, trying you, to help you. You deserve to fail. Yeah, exactly. And so. um you know, I've learned that. Like, that's that's an important lesson, I think, for any young, old entrepreneur, new, old, you know, whatever, anybody, really. I think in business as a whole, right? It's like people have been there, people have walked the path, and I think it's important that we that we um, we follow. You know, we take that advice that, that people are willing to give us, and and you don't have to do it, but you just you should listen to it. And so yeah, or act, maybe not. It, maybe the key is like you have to listen, but if you're not going to listen at least act and pretend you're listening, right? For sure. At, right. Le at least give the person you're dealing with yeah. like the, the impression that you're, you carry your listening, right? Yeah. At least fake the funk, you know? Don't tell the mentor they're wrong. Oh, no. 
<laughs> just take, probably not a good thing to do. Just take it and uh, use use what you need. Yes. Yeah. And to our listeners, we're going to have the links to John's gift and his social media in the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinshlblog.com. And don't forget to support our, our crowdfunding campaign at https slash crowdfunding. And John, do you have your link for your, for your Kickstarter? Not yet. It's uh, it's going live Friday. 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 Okay. But you can find it on our on our website, compodesigns.com. You can find it on our social media. We're talking about it. We're we're definitely promoting it. And so uh, we'd love to have you follow us. And uh, if if you're looking for a tent, the greatest tent in the world, um, we'd love your support. And the code is 20% off, correct? For your listeners, okay. correct. Yeah, Cabinus HR. That's right. Once it goes live on our website. Okay. Yeah. We can't we can't apply it to the Kickstarter. Yeah, but, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So I think I might have asked you this before, but how do you how did you figure out the price for your tent? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically building it to, you know, we may not go to retail, mm -hmm. but like, obviously we need to look at profit. We need to look at, you know, our margins mm -hmm. and, and factor in, uh, you know, uh, acquisition costs, um, uh, promotion Un unknown costs, all that. unknown taxes. You know, yeah. I mean, transportation. You know, we're, we're, it's not exactly cheap to bring product in from China anymore. Oh, sure I think not. the tent category is like a 20 two percent tariff mm -hmm. right and so uh, i know I, we didn't talk about that the tariffs from china yeah it's always a factor always a factor it's, it's, it's kind of crazy like even though china has its highest tariff it's still cheaper to bring stuff from china than build the united states so i don't know if it's a good thing bad thing uh, you know i i think the cost of living here is just it's different right? yeah like, that's true. I, you can't you can't live on 12 bucks six bucks an hour right no. in china you can't um of course, if we built it in Vietnam, it's we have like a much better trade agreement with mm -hmm. Vietnam, and so that's it's a lower cost. But um, we're in China for now, mm -hmm. so um, yeah, it's a factor. Cool. So, John, do you have any? Um, I want to give us any wisdom or advice, or anything you want to talk about to our listeners. Wisdom or advice? Uh, happy wife, happy life. Uh, <laughs> I'll start there. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think. Um, if you're, if you're going to do it, do it, right? You got to go all in. Yeah, right? just get you know, started. I mean, just it, get started. Find people to surround yourself with um, that can help you. And, and I don't mean like give you money, but I mean just like they either want to be a part of it and they want to they help or they're going to give you advice. And, you know, I think that's, that's you, know, you never know, like who's going to give you that, that one little nugget. Um, we talked about it, putting yourself out there, mm -hmm. you know, um, and um you know focus just focus and and, and execution that's, that's what it's all about right i mean like all the people that i follow that i admire um you know elon musk being one of them it's like the man is a machine like 99.9 percent .9 of the population is incapable of anything he does yeah and, and that's okay we don't have to aspire to be him he's a different level but we should just we should try and he's like our generation uh What's his name? Leonardo da Vinci or right. Galileo? Sure. Yeah. I mean, pick any of the, the pioneers. Like Joe Rogan says, Elon Musk is a freaking alien. Yeah. Right. And that's okay. We we can aspire to be like him, but I don't think we should be setting goals to be him. Yeah. You know, we just you gotta you gotta carve your own path, and I think that's important. Um, stay the course. So this is kind of a good story, right? Because like, like entrepreneurs like all oh, you can read rainbows and stuff. And I remember I talked about this in my last podcast. Elon Musk was on some kind of podcast getting interviewed. He just like launched SpaceX, new test. I, I feel like he was crushing, right? Like yeah. in the news, Elon Musk was like the golden guy, right? He was doing everything right. And so God, man, Elon Musk, you're doing this, doing this. What's it like to be Elon Musk right now? Elon Musk pauses, like, you know, he pauses. My life sucks right now. You don't want me Elon Musk. And he's like, what? You don't want me Elon Musk. You, you're, like, you're like the God right now. Like, no, you don't understand. You don't understand all the shit I go through to get to this point, right? Yeah. My life sucks right now. I think a lot of people miss that by entrepreneur. It's, it sucks sometimes, right? It does. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely not all unicorns and rainbows. I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's a, and it's lonely. And, and I think that's, so that's another lesson too. Yeah, it's so and, lonely. And I think, lonely with capital L. Yeah. If there's, if there's another bit, like you got to get in groups, you got to find people that are, that are living and feeling the same way as you. Um, I mean, you, how many friends have you talked to about your business and they're just like, yeah, I don't even know what you're talking about. And you're like, you, so many, and you never will, you no. know, but you find people that are going through the same experience, the same struggles and, and that it gives you hope, you know, and it's, I think you gotta have hope. Right. 
so last question. Let's suppose someone's listening to the podcast, right? Man, John's doing some cool ass shit. Like I'm kind of outdoor guy. I like tents. I like the stuff he's doing. I want to work for John. How does this person reach out to you and, and like try to get on your radar and like work for you? Great question. Um, I told you I like cool people. <laughs> no, I think um, they have to drink yeah, bourbon. Just reach out. Uh, <laughs> that's optional. Um, that's optional for sure. Uh, yeah, reach out. I, I, I love to talk to people, mm-hmm. and 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 I'm happy to talk to anybody about really anything. You know, mm-hmm. I'm I I enjoy the experience, and so um, I would say reach out. Let me know. Um, tell me why. You know, I would want to talk to you let me know what it's about i mean if you just want to shoot the shit tell me you just want to shoot the shit mm-hmm. then that's fine we can do that um yeah follow us on social media and 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 give me a compelling reason i think is is um yeah so don't don't, don't tell me you need 60 grand a year <laughs> <laughs> not yet not yet not yet but once we start making the money uh you know of course uh there's there's something for everybody um you know i i think that's important and it is an early venture. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, people that, that are willing to put that time and energy mm-hmm. into it, um, you know, we only have a few people working on it right now. And so it's, it's an opportunity for sure. So, John, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. I thank appreciate you. everything you're doing for Veterans Residence, Bunker Labs, and just the, all the value you add to everyone. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.